We've all dreamed of visiting the Arctic and witnessing the natural wonders of polar bears frolicking on ice floes or the aurora borealis dancing across the sky. Well, sorry to break it to you, but you won't find any tourists flocking to Antarctica anytime soon. Why, you may ask? Let's dive into it. First off, where is Antarctica? It's located in the Southern Hemisphere, specifically at the South Pole. The Southern Ocean surrounds it, and most of the continent is covered by ice, making it one of the most remote and frigid places on Earth. Now, have you ever met someone who's visited Antarctica? Probably not. It's one of the least visited places on the planet, and only a handful of lucky explorers have seen its interior, which is mostly made up of glaciers and ice fields. But trust me when I say the wildlife and scenery are out of this world. Why shouldn't you travel to Antarctica? Well, for starters, the environment is incredibly fragile and can be easily damaged. Plus, there are no native human populations on the continent, so your travels would essentially be like visiting an uninhabited island. And let's not forget that it's also one of the most expensive destinations to travel to. Despite all that, Antarctica is not exactly guarded like a fortress, but there is an international agreement called the Antarctic Treaty. This treaty was negotiated to prevent any unwanted activity on the continent and bans some forms of testing done there by member states. But the primary reason we can't just waltz into Antarctica is that it has a delicate ecosystem that needs protection. The treaty states that Antarctica should be used for peaceful purposes only and should be free from any human activity that could harm the environment. Scientists are still learning about the continent's unique ecosystem and our activity and machines could disrupt the delicate balance that exists there. If you're still itching to go to Antarctica, getting permission isn't exactly a walk in the park. U.S. citizens, for example, need to complete a special form and send it to the Office of Ocean and Polar Affairs. And once you're there, you'll need to follow some strict guidelines to protect the environment, like not disturbing any wildlife or taking souvenirs like rocks, plants, or animals. Now, technically, can you live in Antarctica? While there are no laws banning people from living there permanently, it's a very inhospitable environment and unsuitable for human habitation. Temperatures can reach negative 76 degrees Fahrenheit and below, making it nearly impossible for anyone to survive without the proper equipment and experience. Plus, the nearest piece of land is over 1,000 miles away, making any inhabitants completely cut off from the rest of the world. Who knows, maybe one day we'll get the chance to visit this unique and fascinating continent. But until then, let's admire it from afar. Let's now talk a bit about the discovery of Antarctica. Unlike other places that were already inhabited, Antarctica never had a native human population. Ancient Greek philosophers had an idea about the continent and called it Antarktos, meaning opposite the bear. The bears it refers to are not the polar ones though, but rather the great and little bear constellations, which are only observable in the northern hemisphere. As a result, the term signifies the opposite of the land of the bear. Whaling and sealing voyages in the late 1700s and early 1800s would venture further south when rounding Cape Horn at the tip of South America. It was known that going further south often meant stronger winds, but also the risk of hitting floating ice of all sizes and of winds and seas that could prove dangerous to the ship and crew. Captain James Cook was the first to cross the Antarctic Circle on January 17, 1773, in the Ross Sea region. He reached a point further north a year later, and though he didn't sight land, he came to within 50 miles and saw deposits of rock held in icebergs, indicating that a more southerly land existed. The first sighting of Antarctica is widely acknowledged to have taken place in January of 1820 during the voyage of two ships under the command of Captain Fabian Gottlieb von Bellingshausen as part of a two-year exploratory expedition around the world to discover new lands. The captain's ships were the first to have crossed the Antarctic Circle since Cook. The first undisputed landing on Antarctica didn't happen until much later, on January 24, 1895, 
at Cape Adare during the whaling voyage of the ship Antarctic led by Henrik Bull. A small boat with six or possibly seven men on board rowed ashore during calm conditions. You might not believe it, but Antarctica is actually a desert. With all that ice, you'd think it'd be like a winter wonderland with snowball fights and hot cocoa all day long. When we think of deserts, we picture camels and cacti and people struggling to find water. But in Antarctica, it's a whole different story. The struggle isn't to find water, it's to find anything that's not covered in ice. And the average rainfall has been just over 0.4 inches in the past 30 years. That's like a few drops of rain compared to what we're used to. So technically, it's not the dunes or sizzling heat that makes a desert, well, a desert. It's the lack of precipitation. But don't worry, if you ever find yourself lost in Antarctica, you won't have to worry about getting thirsty. Just make sure you bring a jacket and some mittens, because it's cold enough to make you into a popsicle. Not only is Antarctica one of the driest places on Earth, but it's also the coldest, the windiest, and the highest. <laughs> Talk about overachieving. The penguins and scientists down in Antarctica have at times found themselves in a bit of a pickle when it comes to time. You see, unlike the rest of us on this big blue planet, there is no Antarctica time zone. All the lines of longitude meet at a single point at the South Pole, making it a bit of a head-scratcher when trying to figure out what time it is. Now, you might be thinking, but how do the scientists and researchers keep track of time down there? Good question. They typically stick to the time zone of the country they departed from. However, with stations from all over the world on the Antarctic Peninsula, things can get a little wacky. Imagine trying to coordinate with your neighboring countries without accidentally waking them up in the middle of the night. You might think that not much could survive in a place where the temperature is extremely cold, the sun barely shows up, and the wind could blow you away faster than a tumbleweed. Well, as in many places on Earth, life found a way in Antarctica too. Believe it or not, this frozen continent is buzzing with activity. It's home to billions of krill, which in turn attract lots of seals and more penguins than you can shake a fish at. But don't let their cute and cuddly appearance fool you. Penguins are the ultimate swimmers, with streamlined bodies that would make Olympic medal winners jealous. They come ashore to breed and chill, but their real talent is stealing pebbles from each other and forming mathematically precise huddles to stay warm. Antarctica is also home to the largest species of penguin on Earth. It's called the emperor penguin. Sure, these creatures are flightless birds, but that doesn't mean they can't jump. In fact, some of them can leap up to 120 inches. And let's not forget about the seals. With their furry bodies and special songs, these marine mammals are protected by the Antarctic Treaty, and they're thriving in the cool waters of the Southern Ocean too. But the real stars of the show are the whales. During the Antarctic summer, these huge creatures show up in droves to chow down on the abundant krill. It's indeed like a whale buffet down there. It's winter, 1980. We're in the small town of Lengbe. 19-year-old Jean Hilliard is driving home after meeting with a friend. She takes a shortcut and turns into an icy, slippery road. In the dark, she loses control of the rear-wheel drive car. The vehicle crashes into a ditch. Emergency lights, snowfall, night, and a hard frost. Jean gets out of the vehicle. She's wearing only a light winter coat, mittens, and cowboy boots. The air temperature is much lower than in a freezer. Jean is sure that her friend lives nearby, so she goes that way. She climbs a high hill and realizes she's taken the wrong route. It seems she's gotten lost. The girl wanders a couple more miles and notices her other friend's house in the distance. Freezing, she walks there. Then everything turns black. Jean loses consciousness. <laughs> 
The next morning, rancher Wally Nelson wakes up in a great mood. It's the holiday season. There's a winter fairy tale outside the window. He leaves his house and notices the body of Jean Hilliard lying just a few feet from his porch. Wally approaches the girl, shakes her, and is horrified. Her body is stiff and cold like frozen wood. Her eyes are open and don't move. Her hair is frozen. She just doesn't look alive. But Wally sees that she's still breathing. Jean has managed to survive. Wally wants to put her in his car to bring her to the doctor. But the girl's body doesn't bend and can't fit into the auto. It feels like a statue. He takes a bigger car and rushes to the hospital as fast as possible. The doctors take Jean, but they don't think she has any chance to make it. Her hand is so hard and frozen that no needle can penetrate it. A low temperature, glassy eyes, and muscles as hard as stone are all the results of emergency mode. Her body has directed all the blood to the vital organs to ensure their functioning. That's why other parts of her body look so lifeless, and her skin and muscles don't react to anything. The doctors decide to put heating pads on the girl to warm her up. Her family hopes for her recovery, but right now, all they can do is just wait. Frostbite is so dangerous because all that frozen liquid begins to expand. Fill a small bottle with water and put it in the freezer for a few hours. Then take it out and you'll see that the bottle seems to have expanded or even cracked because of the increased volume of the liquid. The same thing happens inside our bodies. We consist of almost 70% water. When it freezes, its particles turn into ice crystals and tear cell membranes. Ice fragments can stretch and destroy tissue. This is called frostbite. Also, our body can slow down all internal processes in extreme cold conditions to save strength and energy. The heart makes fewer beats, and the lungs stop consuming lots of oxygen. Metabolism slows down. It happened with Jean, and perhaps it is what saved her life that day. She was lying in the snow in severe frost for about 6 hours. But why didn't the ice particles start destroying her cell membranes? How did her body withstand such damage and manage to survive? Back at the hospital, doctors are happy to watch Jean get better. Warm blood spreads through the frozen vessels and brings her body back to life. Surprisingly, ice crystals haven't damaged her muscles and skin. A few hours later, the girl regains consciousness. By noon, she starts talking. Jean doesn't know what happened. She remembers walking to her friend's house and then waking up in the hospital. What worries her most right now is that her father's car is somewhere in a ditch. As it turns out, the girl fell down and crawled on all fours to Wally Nelson's house. She doesn't remember it, but apparently, her brain activated the survival instinct that night. Unfortunately, she didn't manage to crawl the last few feet. Jean passed out at the door and stayed there for six hours. Doctors examine the girl and understand that she's completely healthy. Soon, she's discharged from the hospital. This case isn't unique. One professor of emergency medicine, David Plummer, said he'd seen about 12 similar cases over the past 10 years when patients had survived severe frostbite. Jean returns home and finds out that she has become famous. People write about her in newspapers, want to interview her, and film documentary shows. Her case has attracted the attention of many doctors around the world. But no one has been able to find out exactly how she managed to survive. In the case of humans, such recoveries seem like an absolute miracle. But many creatures of the natural world can adapt their bodies to extreme conditions. One of them is the tree frog. These animals live mainly in temperate and tropical parts of Eurasia. Sometimes they have to contend with cold weather. Their body injects glucose into the bloodstream when they feel they're freezing. And the content of their cells turns into syrup. Sugar lowers the freezing point of water. So, tree frogs have adapted to such conditions. The water outside their cells can freeze. Their bodies can get as hard as ice cubes. But they will be alive, feeling great. 
Then, when it gets warmer, they fully recover. The blood fills their body and puts all their muscles in motion. But one of the most amazing animals that can withstand freezing temperatures is the ghoulish ice fish. It's transparent and somewhat like a jellyfish. It swims in the dark, cold Antarctic waters. The ghoulish ice fish feels comfortable there because of the antifreeze in its body. More precisely, it's a unique substance that is like antifreeze in its functions. This liquid doesn't allow the animal's cells, organs, and the whole body to freeze. There are no red blood cells in the fish's blood that transport oxygen throughout its body. This is the only vertebrate with such a superpower. There are organisms on our planet that use the cold to prolong their life. Scientists have found some of them in the ice of Siberia. Those are microscopic, multi-celled creatures, like small worms, that can live in a freezer for about 10 years. But the worms from Siberia were about 24,000 years old. The scientists transported them to the laboratory and thawed them. The worms came to life and began to multiply immediately after all those centuries of sleep. Their bodies can go into cryptobiosis. This is when an entire frozen organism has minimal vital functions. The analysis showed that the worms could stay in this mode for tens of thousands of years. And there are many such animals on our planet. Also, these creatures are some of the world's most resistant to radiation. They are practically invulnerable. Now back to our story. It's possible that Gene Hilliard's body went into short cryptobiosis. Perhaps there was some non-freezing liquid in the girl's blood, but no one knows for sure. These days, she has an ordinary job and almost doesn't remember that day. Further research on this topic can help scientists create special medicines that can help in freezing temperatures. Just imagine that you could safely go outside in the winter wearing a t-shirt and a pair of shorts. Steam would be coming off your body and the ice under your feet would be melting. You'd feel hot inside. A dream, perhaps. But realistically, winter coat manufacturers would, of course, never allow it. Your geography teacher must have told you there are seven continents in the world. In 2017, scientists made an announcement that changed this universal truth, the discovery of Zealandia. They called for a change in world maps and provided us with some proof, of course. First off, let's take a look at the ocean floor near New Zealand. The continental shelves of this mysterious continent are chilling at a depth of around 3,280 feet below sea level. The nearby oceanic crust dives even deeper at 9,800 feet below that. All of that is giving us those continent vibes with varying altitudes from deep below the ocean to the majestic Mount Cook, standing tall at 12,217 feet above sea level. Brave geologists have gone deep down to collect rocks from the ocean floor. They found that unlike the nearby oceanic crust, which is made up of fresh basaltic rocks, the crust around New Zealand is one impressive mix. We're talking granite limestone, sandstone, and some ancient rock types that are incredibly ancient. All this screams continental crust. Finally, scientists have discovered a narrow strip of oceanic crust that separates Australia from the hidden land of Zealandia. It means these two are separate continents. 85 million years ago, Zealandia decided to break free from the supercontinent Gondwana. Millions of years later, the Earth's tectonic plates, those puzzle pieces that make up our planet's crust, started throwing a wild party. The mighty Pacific Plate, the heavyweight champion of tectonic plates, decided to take a dive beneath Zealandia's continental crust. This process is called subduction. As a result, the root of Zealandia, that connection to its continental crust, broke off and went into the depths below. So you see now that it takes millions of years and a lot of action for a new continent to form. But what if the impossible happened and a new continent formed overnight in the Pacific Ocean? The next morning, you'd probably spill your morning coffee while watching the news. For this newfound land to be considered a full-fledged continent, it needs to have a surface area like Zealandia. 
and be a large, uninterrupted chunk of land with some water surrounding it. And here comes the twist. The Pacific Ocean has an average depth of 13,000 feet. So, if a continent wanted to join the party, it would have to push a whole lot of rock upward, shaping its way to the surface. A new continent emerging overnight would make sea levels skyrocket. We'd have to say goodbye to geographically low-lying countries like Bangladesh, Senegal, and the Netherlands. The ocean currents would be in for a wild ride, too. The North Pacific subtropical gyre, a vibrant hotspot for marine life, would be thrown off balance. Those poor marine creatures who rely on the currents for their journeys would need some new source of navigation. Plus, the creatures that live permanently in one place could lose their main food source. Oceans are like global free-for-alls, but with a new continent in play, the countries situated nearby would be willing to stake their claim on this unexpected landmass. This new continent would be a blank canvas. No lush landscapes or freshwater sources, just rock and more rock. So, if you are dreaming of relocating to this novelty, you have to wait for some serious terraforming to make it habitable. But for now, let's go back to the real new continent of Zealandia. It's actually a microcontinent, which is an official word for a landmass that has separated from a main continent. In our case, it was Antarctica and then Australia. You could say Zealandia is a bit shy, with only up to 7% of its size peaking above the water surface but it's nearly 70% as large as Australia in total and proudly boasts of two major islands we know and love as New Zealand, the North Island and the South Island. Plus, there are many smaller islets. The largest islands have glaciers, like the famous Tasman Glacier on the South Island. Thanks to some glacial action in the past, Zealandia can show off its fjords and valleys. New Caledonia has a tropical vibe with its Oceania and South Pacific connections. The unofficial eighth continent is a hotspot for geological action. Part of it belongs to the Australian plate, while the rest rides the Pacific plate. It has six major areas with active volcanoes. And don't forget the geothermal treats, geysers and hot springs are scattered all over the place, courtesy of the Australian and Pacific plates having a steamy interaction. The underwater world of Zealandia is a treasure chest of mineral deposits and natural gas fields. It's also a scientific playground. During those icy glacial periods, sea levels dropped and more of Zealandia emerged from the depths. The fossils this process left behind are like an encyclopedia of valuable clues about the life that thrived here during ancient times. The search for Zealandia lasted for 375 years. It all started in 1642, when Dutch seafarer and explorer Abel Tasman set on a mission from Jakarta, Indonesia. Back in the day, Europeans were sure that there had to be a massive land down under to balance out their own continent up north. They even had a fancy name for it, Terra Australis. Tasman was determined to become the first to find it. He went west, then south, then east, all the way to the South Island of New Zealand. But here's where things took a turn for the worst. The local Maori people, who had been living there for centuries, didn't exactly roll out the red carpet. They rammed one of Tasman's small boats, and sadly, four of the Europeans met their ends. What happened next remains a mystery. But a few weeks later, Tasman sailed back home without ever stepping foot on this mysterious land he believed to be the great southern continent. He never came back. The explorer didn't even realize that he was actually right all along about the existence of a missing continent. And you already know it only became official in 2017. Another lost and found continent isn't hiding in the ocean, but under Europe. It's called the Greater Adria, and it collided with Europe and started to sink under it around 140 million years ago. Today, it lies beneath Italy, Greece, and the Baltics. Its size and even shape match that of Greenland, the world's largest island. Greater Adria is no longer visible, but it left some clues. Parts of it were embedded in the Alps. Other chucks were incorporated into present-day Italy and Croatia on the other side of the Adriatic Sea. 
Limestone rocks from the former continent started to change once they were under the European landmass. Tremendous heat and pressure spread over tens of millions of years changed their structure. Out goes the limestone, in comes the marble. All the Greek and Roman temples you admired on your summer vacation were constructed using this marble. It was sort of a going away gift from a long lost continent. You don't notice this, but our planet never stops moving, and it happens deep beneath our feet. 120 million years ago, Australia and Antarctica were a single piece of land. They went their separate ways, but Antarctica didn't leave empty-handed. Today, there is an oceanic plateau in the Indian Ocean. Long ago, it was connected to another lost continent, the Kerguelen microcontinent. Scientists believe that it made a land bridge between India and Antarctica. To find out what it was like, we can look at a tiny archipelago in the southern Indian Ocean. These islands are all that is left of the ancient landmass. They have a cold climate and feature glaciers because they're so close to Antarctica. But in the past, the climate must have been temperate with plenty of rainfall. The animals and plants would have been similar to those that we find in tropical regions today. The lost continent landscape was probably much like that of New Zealand. Our planet keeps changing, and at some point, all the continents will reconnect with each other, forming one supercontinent again. And maybe then, future humans will wonder, what if our continent broke into pieces tomorrow? The theory of parallel worlds has been discussed in the scientific community for a very long time. Unfortunately, we're not developed enough yet to prove or disprove it. But it's still an interesting theory, and that's why we have a lot of unusual urban legends about the guests from a parallel reality, according to many. Let's check out a few of them. A man from a non-existent country. This story took place in 1851 in a small German village, Frankfurt an der Oder. A lost man came out to the local villagers asking for help. The man introduced himself as Jopar Voren. He spoke very poor German and had a very strong accent. The man himself claimed that he speaks Laxar and Abram, languages that don't actually exist on our earth. He claimed to be from Laxaria, a country on the mainland called Sacria, separated from Europe by a huge ocean. However, none of these places existed on the Earth's map. People sent Yopar to the local authorities. He talked to a psychiatrist, but the doctor concluded that the man was totally sane. An investigation by the local police also revealed nothing suspicious about him. Yopar Voren claimed that the purpose of his visit to Europe was to find his long-lost brother. He survived a shipwreck and found himself near the village. They showed him a map of the world and a globe and asked him to indicate the place where he crashed, but he didn't recognize anything familiar. He seemed to have extensive knowledge about his homeworld. Yopar named five main continents on it, Sakria, Aflar, Ostar, Auslar, and Uplar. His story was considered plausible. Scientists from Frankfurt decided to send the man to Berlin for further research. However, during the trip, he had something like a seizure. The man suddenly jumped out of the carriage and disappeared into the surrounding forest. Despite a long and thorough search, no traces of Jopar were found. He seemed to have disappeared as mysteriously as he had appeared. Inspector Lebouf, who was assigned to escort him to Berlin, thought this man could be a being from another world and that he had returned from where he had come from. Lady on Highway 167 This incident happened on October 20th, 1969. It was first reported in 1988 in the magazine Strange. The article tells about two men, L.C. and his business partner, Charlie. The names are fictitious. One afternoon, L.C. and Charlie were driving along Highway 167 in southwest Louisiana. Discussing work, they drove toward the oil center of Lafayette. The highway was empty at first, but then the men noticed a very old and very slow car ahead. The men started discussing this mysterious car. Such cars hadn't been produced for several decades, but this one looked quite new. The men thought it was thanks to the owner's care and admired it. 
they slowed down to get a better look at the car. LC noticed a bright orange sign on it that said 1940. They saw a driver. It was a young woman in old-fashioned clothes, a hat with a long feather and a fur coat, even though it was warm outside. There was a child next to her, also dressed in a warm coat and a hat. LC and Charlie wanted to talk to her, but then they noticed the expression on her face. The woman was looking around in panic, almost on the verge of crying. LC called out to her and asked if she needed help. She nodded, and he gestured for her to park on the side of the road. But when the men also parked, they suddenly noticed that the woman's car had disappeared. They looked around the highway in shock. She couldn't have gone somewhere far so fast, but the car was nowhere to be found. After some time, another man drove up to LC and Charlie. He saw everything that happened and claimed that the car had simply disappeared. The men talked about the incident for several hours. When they reached the city, they contacted the police. However, the police couldn't help them in any way. Apart from their words, there was no confirmation of the existence of the car. The case was discussed for a while in local newspapers and then was forgotten. The Gadianton Canyon Incident This incident occurred in May of 1972 in southeastern Utah near the Modena Railroad Crossing on the edge of the Escalante Desert. Jenna North was driving her father's 1971 Chevrolet Nova. Her friend, Carol Abbott, was in the passenger seat. In the back seat, there were two other girls, Lisa Rockford and Bethany Gordon. It was after 10 p.m. when the girls crossed the Utah-Nevada state line. They wanted to get back to campus before their housekeeper, Mrs. Mortensen, locked the dorm doors. This stretch of Highway 56 in Utah is pretty deserted. There's nothing there but sand and a few plants. The girls were very happy when they finally noticed the Union Pacific Railroad crossing in Modena. But right behind the railing, Jenna noticed two highways. One went into the desert, and the other to Gadianton Canyon. The girls decided to take the road to the canyon. They thought it would be a shortcut to campus. The other girls were chatting with each other when Jenna noticed that they were no longer driving on asphalt, but on white cement. Watch out, suddenly shouted one of the girls. The road ended abruptly at a high rock wall. It was a dead end. They had to go back the same way they came here. And while Jenna's friends were complaining that now they would have to sleep in the car, Jenna saw that the landscape had changed dramatically. They weren't in the desert anymore. Instead, the canyon turned into an open area with wheat fields, pine thickets, and a small lake ahead. A full moon was shining in the sky, which was strange because it shouldn't have been there that night. The girls had no idea where they were, so they just drove to the light ahead. It was some building that they thought was a diner or restaurant. The girls saw a bright neon sign, but none of them could read what was written on it. These symbols were unlike any language they knew. Suddenly, several people came out of the building. They seemed shocked and frightened by Jenna's Chevrolet. They waved their hands and shouted something, but the girls didn't understand them. Lisa decided to ask the men for directions. She stuck her head out of the window and immediately let out a terrifying scream. Get out of here, she shouted to Jenna. The Chevrolet sped away from the building. Bright headlights illuminated their car from behind. They were being chased by a few vehicles. These vehicles were egg-shaped, had three wheels, and made a buzzing sound. The road ahead led back to the canyon. Jenna didn't have time to slow down and crashed right into it. The vehicles had disappeared together with an unfamiliar landscape. The girls were back in the desert again. Fortunately, none of them were hurt, physically. But Lisa was in a state of shock. She was saying again and again, they weren't human. The girls had to help her walk. An hour later, they were able to stop a Utah Highway Patrol car. They told the police their story. The details of the report compiled by the police officer were complicated and confusing. During the investigation, the police couldn't figure out from the tire tracks exactly where the car went astray. The tracks ended very abruptly, as if the Chevrolet had suddenly disappeared. The police couldn't explain how the car could have driven two miles without leaving any traces, especially on such solid ground. There are still disputes about this story, but in the end, 
All versions and explanations of what happened are just guesses. Perhaps we'll never find out the truth. These were the urban legends about interdimensional traveling. Of course, there's no proof that any of these stories are real. Often the truth turns out to be very mundane. For example, the famous man from Taured, who people also called a guest from another reality, turned out to be a simple fraudster named John Allen Kuchar Zegrus. But even so, these stories are still very interesting. Do you know that NASA explores not only stars, planets, galaxies, or black holes? Hard to believe, but yes. The agency also works on discoveries here on our home planet Earth. So what has NASA recently discovered? Is there life under the ice? While they were analyzing data recently, they discovered something unbelievable hiding under Antarctica's ice. And this discovery not only changes everything we know about the whole water system of the Earth, but it may also help with research about life in space. Humankind's existence might depend on understanding Antarctica and its secrets. So, the recent discoveries reveal vital information about our survival. But before we continue, let's see how much you know about this place, where it's only ice as far as your eyes can see. Antarctica is one of the world's seven continents in the Southern Hemisphere. It's the fifth largest continent in terms of total area, and that means it's almost twice the size of Australia. Want to see real meteorites? Go to Antarctica! Due to its dry climate, Antarctica is one of the best places to observe space. But what's even greater is that you can find meteorites on the white surface of the continent. Scientists have already plucked about 45,000 meteorites from the ice, and they think they can see another 300,000. Since there aren't many terrestrial rocks there, it's easy for them to spot them thanks to their dark color. Antarctica's dry desert environment also helps preserve them, even the ones that fell to Earth more than one million years ago. And can you imagine any volcanic activity in Antarctica? It's hard. But this place is where fire meets the ice. West Antarctica is where most volcanic activity occurs. Scientists recently found that 138 volcanoes exist in West Antarctica alone. Wow! You would think that Antarctica is always cold, but no. Its coastal regions can get as warm as 50 degrees Fahrenheit. But have you ever wondered what Antarctica would look like if there were no ice? It may seem unimaginable now, but it was not always covered by ice. That was 34 million years ago, though, so nobody could tell how the continent's surface would be without the ice. But NASA changed that. They generated computer simulations and created the most accurate map of it as of today. What they saw was incredible. The continent was not flat at all like it seemed. It's pretty bumpy with valleys, rolling plains, and high mountains. But this was nothing next to what they had discovered under Antarctica's ice. So, what is it? Drum roll, please. NASA found two new subglacial lakes. And what's even cooler about it is that they spotted these lakes from space. How is that? If your answer is high-tech satellites, then you're right. In 2003, NASA launched a satellite called IceSat. It measured ice sheet mass balance and cloud and aerosol heights. The satellite also helped create the ice-free map of Antarctica. In 2010, the European Space Agency launched the second satellite, Cryosat-2. It was for tracking the changes in the thickness of the ice. Then, in 2018, NASA launched the third one, IceSat-2, a follow-on to the IceSat spacecraft. It measured ice sheet elevation and sea ice thickness. It was NASA's most advanced Earth-observing laser instrument. It delivered the highest precision data. And when that was combined with the data from the other satellites, it was possible to spot these two new lakes near a pair of larger ones. But how is it possible that these lakes exist in the first place? The average thickness of most Antarctica ice is approximately 1.2 miles. However, 
it can get over 1.8 miles thick in some places, especially during the winter. So you might think that there's nothing under there, but science says otherwise. It's not quite possible to see it with your bare eyes, but the continent's ice is slowly but constantly flowing in different directions under the force of its weight. But scientists could not figure out how water moved for many years. That started to change in 2007, when data gathered from the ice sat provided insight into what hides beneath the surface. They first discovered an entire network of meltwater lakes connected under Antarctica's fast-flowing ice streams, and there were hundreds of them. Scripps Institution of Oceanography glaciologist Helen Amanda Fricker figured that the elevation changes measured by ice sat happened because of the dynamics of these lakes. They did not hold meltwater statically. Instead, they were filling and draining continuously over time through a system of waterways. And as they did that, the ice above rose and fell. But where do they drain? The ocean, of course, and it drains a lot. A recent study, co-authored by Fricker, found that the drainage of one lake flushed as much as 198 billion gallons into the ocean in only three days. Countless mysteries about how nature works are still waiting to be solved. But finding the two new lakes will give scientists a better picture of how fast the Antarctic ice sheet will change as the climate gets warmer and how this will affect global ocean currents and sea level rise. The filling and draining cycle of the lakes also caused the ice sheet to suffer cracks and crevices. So the information they find from these new lakes will also give them a better understanding of the damage on the surface of the ice. They will also be able to assess how this filling and draining system influences the speed at which ice slips into the oceans and seas. And that means they can evaluate how the added freshwater may alter marine ecosystems. This discovery may also suggest whether life is under the ice. Wow! Scientists drilled through about 3,504 feet of ice and found that water samples taken from one of the lakes contained approximately 10,000 bacterial cells per milliliter. Such a high number of bacterial life is a good sign because that means the icy waters might also support higher life forms, such as microanimals, and one of these new lakes might even be their home. But the most exciting thing is that the new lakes might help them understand whether life on other planets is possible. Scientists believe any life below the frozen surface of the planet Mars might follow the patterns seen in Antarctica's lakes. So, there is a possibility that they might find critical new information on the type of life that may have existed on the red planet. You wouldn't want to be there during the winter, though. The lowest temperature on Earth you can experience is negative 128 degrees Fahrenheit. In 2010, there was an even lower temperature of negative 135 degrees Fahrenheit. And you may feel this cold much worse due to the strong and dry winds. Did you know that the size of the ice surface on Antarctica also changes throughout the year? It's about 1.2 million square miles during the summer. But when it's winter, it grows to 7.3 million square miles. Yet, despite the change, it remains the largest piece of ice on Earth. Sorry, Arctic, you lose. Do you know these cute little penguins? Consider these animals the locals, because there is no native population in Antarctica. It's a no-man's land, because no single country owns it. But do you know who really owns it? Five different species of penguins, seals, and killer whales. Ha ha. Despite the continent's harsh conditions, you can visit it as a tourist for fishing and research purposes. Around 5,000 people reside on the continent during summer at research stations. But when winter comes, the number naturally drops down to 1,000. Antarctica Legend has it that in the 17th century, Sir Isaac Newton noticed an apple fall from a tree and began wondering why the fruit had fallen to the ground and not upward or sideways. Well, that would be freaky. After years of studying, he concluded that gravity must be the culprit. The scientists called it a force of attraction that existed between all objects. But it was Albert Einstein, many years later, that revolutionized these ideas about gravity. 
Legend also has it that he wasn't completely satisfied with Newton's findings. Something just didn't seem right. As a young scientist, Einstein had some trouble formulating his theories, trying to explain the behavior of moving objects. When an experiment came to his mind, he called it the happiest of thoughts. Gravity feels like the sensation of riding in an ascending elevator. He called it general relativity. Einstein began working tirelessly, trying to prove this idea. At one point, he even complained he was on the brink of losing his mind. Now, in the simplest terms, general relativity claims that gravity is the curvature or warping of space. The greater mass an object has, the more it warps the space around it. Imagine a heavy ball resting on a trampoline. The rubber sheet under it gets warped under its weight. It's the same with our sun. It's big enough to twist space across the entire solar system. That's why our planet, as well as all the others, orbit around the star. This warping also impacts how we measure time. If you look at your watch, time seems to go by at the same rate every day. But if you hike to the top of a mountain and your friend wanders through a valley at the bottom of this mountain, you'll see that your watches will calculate time differently. One watch will tick faster, while the hands of the second one, which is traveling through the valley, will move more slowly. That's because gravity affects how fast time goes by. With these experiments in mind, Einstein concluded that gravity was not a force of attraction, but rather a curvature in the fabric of space-time. We feel gravity as a force simply because we're placed on some surface. If there was no surface and no attraction between us and this surface, we would become weightless. If you don't mind getting some weird looks, try this experiment. You'll need a bathroom scale and an elevator to ride. You'll soon see that your weight fluctuates as you move up and down in the building in the elevator. The gravitational force is the same, but your weight is different because the elevator speeds up and slows down. Aboard the International Space Station, astronauts literally move along with the station, so there's nothing to push them against the side of the station so that they have some weight. Even if we still think of gravity as a force, it's the weakest one we know. First of all, it only attracts. There's no negative counterpart that could push things away. And weirdly, even though this force is strong enough to keep galaxies together, we still overcome it every day. Every time you lift an object off the floor, you overcome the force of gravity produced by the entire Earth. Ooh! Just to paint a better picture, Earth's gravitational pull is weaker than the power of a refrigerator magnet. The fact that our planet has gravity also affects the way we look and act. All creatures on Earth are limited in growth by the height of their skeleton and by how much weight it can carry, which is directly proportional to gravity. That's why some marine creatures can grow bigger. The largest animal on our planet right now is the Antarctic blue whale. It's about the size of two school buses combined. That's because sea creatures can float, which slightly counteracts gravity. The effects of gravity can be seen in people, too. We are taller in the morning than we are in the evening. Our everyday activities and the added effect of gravity make the cartilage in our ankles, knees, hips, back, and neck compress. Once you have overnight rest, the cartilage swells back to normal. Gravity might also affect your shower routine. That is, if you're an astronaut. They have to rely on the old-fashioned way of bathing up there on the space station. They can't take a shower since the force of gravity up there is different and water doesn't flow as it should. Instead, they use liquid soap, water, and no-rinse shampoo. They first squeeze some liquid soap and water from pre-made water pouches onto their skin. Next, they open the no-rinse shampoo and add a little water to wash their hair. Towels are then used to wipe off the excess water, which is really precious in space. To make sure they recycle it, an airflow system quickly evaporates excess water. Gravity and weight shouldn't be confused. Astronauts on the space station do float, and you may sometimes hear that they are in the state of zero gravity. It's far from the truth, though, since gravity up there is about 90% of its value on our planet. But astronauts look and feel weightless, since weight is the force a certain object exerts on them back on Earth. Most creatures have evolved to sense and adapt to Earth's gravitational pull. In the sea, for instance, 
Some fish have floating calcium carbonate deposits in their heads. Scientists call them ear stones, and they're pulled down by gravity. They act like a fish's internal compass. Now, plants have evolved to grow starch grains in the tips of their roots. They use this amazing feature to force their roots deep down into the soil. As little as we seem to understand it these days, we do need gravity for way more things than we can imagine. For instance, some bacteria become even more dangerous in space where there's little to no gravity. Salmonella, for example, the type of bacteria that is known to cause food poisoning, becomes three times nastier in the condition of microgravity. So you really gotta cook your chicken. Our own moon stays where it is because of the effects of gravity, too. If it weren't for this force, our satellite would have floated away by now. But it's held in place by Earth's gravitational pull. Objects with the biggest gravitational pulls in the universe are black holes. Thankfully, our planet is really far away from any of them. Nothing can escape the gravitational pull of a black hole, not even light itself. Similarly, gravity is different on each planet. And because of that, things weigh differently depending on which planet they're on. Take Earth, for example. An object that weighs 100 pounds here would only be 38 pounds on Mercury. But if you're planning on losing weight fast, try booking a trip to Pluto. Someone who weighs 150 pounds on Earth would weigh no more than 10 pounds on Pluto. The same person would weigh considerably more on Jupiter, which is the planet with the most powerful gravity. 150 pounds on Earth would turn into more than 354 pounds there. Mm, no thanks. Remember that experiment with watches ticking at different levels of elevation? It turns out that gravity isn't spread evenly on the surface of Earth. Why? Because our planet isn't a perfect sphere. The mass of Earth isn't evenly distributed either. That's why you get variations in gravity in different locations. More so, gravity is weaker at the equator because of the centrifugal forces produced by the planet's rotation. Since we've always perceived gravity as a force, we seem to believe that it has somewhat of a suction motion. But it's not exactly true. Back in 1998, scientists were baffled to see that the expansion of the universe was speeding up. So they linked this to the repulsive gravity of mysterious dark energy. We now know that dark energy makes up for more than 60% of the mass energy of our whole universe. But since nobody knows what it actually is, we can only make assumptions. And one that's largely accepted is quantum theory which seems to claim that gravity pushes rather than pulls things in. You got all that? I may need to watch this one again. We've all dreamed of visiting the Arctic and witnessing the natural wonders of polar bears frolicking on ice floes or the aurora borealis dancing across the sky. Well, sorry to break it to you, but you won't find any tourists flocking to Antarctica anytime soon. Why, you may ask? Let's dive into it. First off, where is Antarctica? It's located in the Southern Hemisphere, specifically at the South Pole. The Southern Ocean surrounds it, and most of the continent is covered by ice, making it one of the most remote and frigid places on Earth. Now, have you ever met someone who's visited Antarctica? Probably not. It's one of the least visited places on the planet, and only a handful of lucky explorers have seen its interior, which is mostly made up of glaciers and ice fields. But trust me when I say, the wildlife and scenery are out of this world. Why shouldn't you travel to Antarctica? Well, for starters, the environment is incredibly fragile and can be easily damaged. Plus, there are no native human populations on the continent, so your travels would essentially be like visiting an uninhabited island. And let's not forget that it's also one of the most expensive destinations to travel to. Despite all that, Antarctica is not exactly guarded like a fortress, but there is an international agreement called the Antarctic Treaty. This treaty was negotiated to prevent any unwanted activity on the continent and bans some forms of testing done there by member states. But the primary reason we can't just waltz into Antarctica is that it has a delicate ecosystem that needs protection. The treaty states that Antarctica should be used for peaceful purposes only and should be free from any human activity that could harm the environment. Scientists are still learning about the continent's unique ecosystem, 
and our activity and machines could disrupt the delicate balance that exists there. If you're still itching to go to Antarctica, getting permission isn't exactly a walk in the park. U.S. citizens, for example, need to complete a special form and send it to the Office of Ocean and Polar Affairs. And once you're there, you'll need to follow some strict guidelines to protect the environment, like not disturbing any wildlife or taking souvenirs like rocks, plants, or animals. Now, technically, can you live in Antarctica? While there are no laws banning people from living there permanently, it's a very inhospitable environment and unsuitable for human habitation. Temperatures can reach negative 76 degrees Fahrenheit and below, making it nearly impossible for anyone to survive without the proper equipment and experience. Plus, the nearest piece of land is over 1,000 miles away, making any inhabitants completely cut off from the rest of the world. Who knows, maybe one day we'll get the chance to visit this unique and fascinating continent. But until then, let's admire it from afar. Let's now talk a bit about the discovery of Antarctica. Unlike other places that were already inhabited, Antarctica never had a native human population. Ancient Greek philosophers had an idea about the continent and called it Antarctos, meaning opposite the bear. The bears it refers to are not the polar ones though, but rather the great and little bear constellations, which are only observable in the northern hemisphere. As a result, the term signifies the opposite of the land of the bear. Whaling and sealing voyages in the late 1700s and early 1800s would venture further south when rounding Cape Horn at the tip of South America. It was known that going further south often meant stronger winds, but also the risk of hitting floating ice of all sizes and of winds and seas that could prove dangerous to the ship and crew. Captain James Cook was the first to cross the Antarctic Circle on January 17, 1773, in the Ross Sea region. He reached a point further north a year later, and though he didn't sight land, he came to within 50 miles and saw deposits of rock held in icebergs, indicating that a more southerly land existed. The first sighting of Antarctica is widely acknowledged to have taken place in January of 1820 during the voyage of two ships under the command of Captain Fabian Gottlieb von Bellingshausen as part of a two-year exploratory expedition around the world to discover new lands. The captain's ships were the first to have crossed the Antarctic Circle since Cook. The first undisputed landing on Antarctica didn't happen until much later, on January 24, 1895, at Cape Adare during the whaling voyage of the ship Antarctic led by Henrik Bull. A small boat with six or possibly seven men on board rowed ashore during calm conditions. You might not believe it, but Antarctica is actually a desert. With all that ice, you'd think it'd be like a winter wonderland with snowball fights and hot cocoa all day long. When we think of deserts, we picture camels and cacti and people struggling to find water. But in Antarctica, it's a whole different story. The struggle isn't to find water, it's to find anything that's not covered in ice. And the average rainfall has been just over 0.4 inches in the past 30 years. That's like a few drops of rain compared to what we're used to. So technically, it's not the dunes or sizzling heat that makes a desert, well, a desert. It's the lack of precipitation. But don't worry, if you ever find yourself lost in Antarctica, you won't have to worry about getting thirsty. Just make sure you bring a jacket and some mittens because it's cold enough to make you into a popsicle. Not only is Antarctica one of the driest places on Earth, but it's also the coldest, the windiest, and the highest. <laughs> Talk about overachieving. The penguins and scientists down in Antarctica have at times found themselves in a bit of a pickle when it comes to time. You see, unlike the rest of us on this big blue planet, there is no Antarctica time zone. All the lines of longitude meet at a single point at the South Pole, making it a bit of a head-scratcher when trying to figure out what time it is. Now, you might be thinking, but how do the scientists and researchers keep track of time down there? Good question. They typically stick to the time zone of the country they departed from. However, 
With stations from all over the world on the Antarctic Peninsula, things can get a little wacky. Imagine trying to coordinate with your neighboring countries without accidentally waking them up in the middle of the night. You might think that not much could survive in a place where the temperature is extremely cold, the sun barely shows up, and the wind could blow you away faster than a tumbleweed. Well, as in many places on Earth, life found a way in Antarctica too. Believe it or not, this frozen continent is buzzing with activity. It's home to billions of krill, which in turn attract lots of seals and more penguins than you can shake a fish at. But don't let their cute and cuddly appearance fool you. Penguins are the ultimate swimmers, with streamlined bodies that would make Olympic medal winners jealous. They come ashore to breed and chill, but their real talent is stealing pebbles from each other and forming mathematically precise huddles to stay warm. Antarctica is also home to the largest species of penguin on Earth. It's called the emperor penguin. Sure, these creatures are flightless birds, but that doesn't mean they can't jump. In fact, some of them can leap up to 120 inches. And let's not forget about the seals. With their furry bodies and special songs, these marine mammals are protected by the Antarctic Treaty, and they're thriving in the cool waters of the Southern Ocean, too. But the real stars of the show are the whales. During the Antarctic summer, these huge creatures show up in droves to chow down on the abundant krill. It's indeed like a whale buffet down there. We're in Siberia. It's so cold here that freezing gusts of wind are burning your face. All that white snow seems to be blinding you. This place resembles Antarctica because of the permafrost. Recently, a group of scientists researched one of the local rivers. With the help of a drilling rig, they extracted several samples of frozen soil. The scientists were shocked to find living creatures inside the ice. Later in the laboratory, they realized that the creatures were microscopic multi-celled organisms known as deloid rotifers. These creatures looked like little worms. Scientists knew that these worms could live in frozen conditions for up to 10 years. But the age of the rotifers found in the ice was about 24,000 years. And after defrosting, they began to reproduce, as if they had been sleeping for several hours, not thousands of years. Further analysis showed that these organisms could stay frozen for hundreds of thousands of years. The rotifers might have lived during the time when people didn't invent the wheel yet. And this isn't their only superpower. Deloid rotifers are among the most radioactively resistant animals on Earth. They can survive in places where there's no oxygen and water. They can also stay alive in areas with high acidity and can live without food and water for a long time. By the way, these are not the only creatures that are known for living for thousands of years. Particular types of moss and some microorganisms are also almost immortal. Nematodes, also called roundworms, are some of the most adaptive varieties of worms in the world. Imagine the Eiffel Tower standing tall and proud. And now, let's make it 10 times higher and place it underground. Exactly at this depth, many thousands of feet under the surface, scientists discovered these creatures. There's no sunlight and almost no air in this place. And since it's much closer to Earth's core than the surface of our planet, the temperature here is higher than in the middle of the hottest desert. Millions of tons of soil above create insane pressure. But all this couldn't prevent life from developing here. When roundworms run out of air, food, or when the temperature becomes too high, they get into a unique state of stasis, or deep hibernation. In this mode, the worm's metabolism slows down, and almost all the processes in their bodies stop. The creatures can sleep for a very long time and only wake up when the environment becomes more livable. By the way, you don't have to go so deep underground to find these creatures. Nematodes are found all over the world. They can live in hot springs, deserts, high in the mountains, among the harsh ices of Antarctica, or inside animals and humans. Our next invulnerable creatures are tardigrades, also known as water bears. These are microscopic eight-legged invertebrates, closely related to arthropods. It's impossible to see them with the unaided eye. But a conventional microscope will allow you to see tardigrades in detail. They look like minuscule bears. They're called water bears because they need a thin layer of water around their bodies at all times. It's necessary to prevent dehydration. 
tardigrades have been found in all kinds of environments, from ocean depths to sand dunes. They're incredibly robust, thanks to their unique organism structure. Yeah, they look soft, but their body is covered with a tough cuticle. This coating resembles the exoskeletons of grasshoppers, mantises, and many other insects. Water bears shed their old layer of the cuticle when they need to grow. Each of their eight legs has four to six claws, which helps them cling to any surface. The bears can survive at a temperature that's almost three times as cold as the temperature in the ice of Antarctica. Heat doesn't harm them either. They have been proved to survive at the temperature that makes water boil. Also, water bears are not afraid of radiation and high pressure. In the depths of the ocean, pressure can destroy alloys of the strongest metals. But these creatures can withstand pressures six times greater. But the coolest thing is that they can live in the vacuum of space. Our planet has a magnetic field. This is a shield that protects us from solar radiation. Tardigrades don't need this protection. They can go into near-Earth orbit and come back unharmed. All thanks to a protein protecting their DNA from ionizing radiation. Like other immortal organisms, water bears can fall into a state of cryptobiosis. Tardigrades pull their head and legs inside their bodies and fall asleep. If the surrounding conditions suggest freezing, drying out, or experiencing a lack of oxygen, they will remain in this barrel form until the situation improves. So those are microscopic organisms and microbes that can only be seen through a microscope. But how about something bigger? Meet ironclad beetles. They live in the southwestern US and Mexico. These insects can not survive high temperatures, live without oxygen, or in conditions of increased radiation. But their shells are so tough that they can only be pierced with a drill or hammer. Their durable exoskeletons are made of a special substance, chitin. It can also be found in the armor of crabs or shrimp. And still, the chitin of the ironclad beetle is so durable that it allows this creature to withstand the impact of a car moving at high speed. In times of danger, they can hide their whiskers and strong legs in special recesses in their shell. Other animals can't bite through the armor, so they spit the beetle out and leave to look for lunch somewhere else. As soon as the danger disappears, the bug stretches out its legs again and goes about its business. Also, the armor saves the beetles from dehydration which is very useful in hot areas of Mexico and the southwestern U.S. Inside the exoskeleton, they can store moisture. In other words, these bugs can absorb water whenever they find it and transport this liquid inside themselves. The next creatures are incredibly fragile, but they know how to survive in places where almost no other animals can live. We're going to the southeast of Romania, near the Black Sea. Here, on a desolate wide plain, you can notice a pit. This is a mine leading deep underground. The air on the surface of our planet usually contains around 20% oxygen, but in the mine, it's only 10%. Inside the cave, the air also has an increased content of hydrogen sulfide and carbon dioxide. People can't breathe there without an oxygen tank. We can probably say that the water and air there are poisoned. Almost no animals would be able to survive here. Still. 48 species of living organisms have been found in this cave. 33 of them are newly discovered species. And they aren't the only microbes or bacteria that can't be seen without a microscope. Something bigger lives here. Strange white snails crawl over the walls of the mines. Transparent shrimp and a bunch of unknown kind of leeches swim in the water. White centipedes with huge whiskers and creepy white spiders run on the ground and they all have been growing here for almost 5 million years. You might notice a water scorpion and another unidentified species of this animal. It doesn't look like its relatives living in hot sands or tropical forests. No living creature here looks ordinary at all. All animals are either white or transparent. They have no eyes, but are equipped with long paws and antennae whiskers that help them navigate in this dark space. The deeper you go into the cave, the less oxygen the air contains. But the number of living organisms is increasing. The air is filled with methane and carbon dioxide. All the inhabitants of this cave have never seen the light of the sun and have never gone out of the darkness. It seems impossible to survive in such conditions where plants don't produce oxygen. The answer to the question of their survival is hidden in a small lake. 
the surface of the water is covered with strange foam. If you look closely, you can see that this white substance is alive. It resembles soft, wet paper that is easy to tear. The thing is billions of living organisms, bacteria called autotrophs. There's much more carbon dioxide in the cave than there is outside. And these bacteria, like plants, absorb it. But they don't do this with the help of photosynthesis, which means they don't need sunlight. They use water for chemosynthesis. What these bacteria secrete is food for other bacteria. And these other bacteria are food for bigger creatures. A unique food cycle that you can't find anywhere else on the planet only exists here. Scientists claim that Icelandia was a region between Greenland and Scandinavia that was more than 230,000 square miles but is now underwater. The Earth was once a large pizza pie with all the continents connected to each other millions of years ago, otherwise known as Pangaea. The North Atlantic region we know today was dry land from about 335 million to 175 million years ago. For many years, scientists and geologists assumed that the North Atlantic Ocean was birthed as Pangaea began to split apart roughly 200 million years ago. With volcanoes in the region where Iceland is, the country came to be just 60 million years ago as it broke off and sailed away from all the other lands. And since the Earth was like a large pizza pie, it divided like one. Many of the land split up into many large and small pieces, creating the continents we know today. But this new theory suggests that the result of Pangaea's splitting left out some land that stretched for around 200 miles. And just about 10 million years ago, that piece of land submerged in the waters on the eastern and western side, leaving the tip of the land, which is now Iceland. When plate tectonics move, they grind on each other, which gave shape to our current landscape, all thanks to the mantle. This new radical theory goes against everything written in history books and what scientists have been studying. They began shaking heads, drawing lots of skepticism and criticism. But by analyzing the ocean floor under Iceland and the Earth's crust, we can assume that this idea isn't far-fetched. The crust beneath Iceland happens to be a lot thicker than the typical ones. Oceanic crust is made up of unique melted rocks compared to the land crusts where we walk and live on, and is a lot more denser. The thinnest layer on Earth is the crust, where life takes place. It's essential for water, growing food, gathering natural resources and minerals, and breathing in oxygen. It sinks below to the bottom, but right above the Earth's mantle. It also refreshes itself, since it constantly gets recycled into the mantle and back up. This is why the rocks in the oceanic crust are around 25 miles thick, compared to just 5 miles anywhere else. This is also reasonable given that it's in a hot spot for volcanoes. Magnetic surveys of the ocean floor show layers of molten crust in stripe patterns. Also given the fact that the Earth's magnetic field changed its polarity over millions of years, it played a role in shaping the foundation of our landscape. But there isn't any hmm. concrete evidence to prove this new theory just yet. One of the first steps is to start digging the ocean floor near Iceland. Zircon is a very sturdy mineral that can last for billions of years despite erosion in the Earth's crust. By taking samples and studying them, researchers can estimate the geological age of the continents. This will make sure the crust is oceanic, which is thicker, or continental, which is the regular crust we walk on. This isn't an overnight project and would come with a hefty cost. Another way is to do seismic surveys that can measure echoes conducted on research ships. Drilling holes miles deep in the crust can also help with the research. But this would cost more than studying the zircon minerals. Some fossilized plants unique to both Scandinavia and Greenland might prove that Icelandia was once on the surface and possibly scattered with trees. It wasn't a cold land as it is today, so it may have had forests. But scientists still haven't found fossil evidence of animals common in both lands to suggest anything. But maybe time will tell. 
The theory goes deeper, which suggests that there was a greater Icelandia. With Iceland, Ireland, Britain, Scandinavia, and Greenland all in one microcontinent, it could be a destination of winter enthusiasts and great for skiing. It could be possible to connect Canada to greater Icelandia by train over the ocean, which would open up the economy even more. Iceland is around 40,000 square miles, which is already quite big. And if the greater Icelandia was present today, then Europe would be a completely different continent. Many theories are circulating about other possible hidden microcontinents around the world. Scientists aren't certain of the possibility of Icelandia's existence. But if all the studies conducted were done correctly, then the theory could change everything we know about Iceland and the North Atlantic Ocean. And this could pave the way for other sunken microcontinents around the world. Another theory out there is that New Zealand was the tip of a lost subcontinent, even bigger than Icelandia, called Zealandia. Studies show that it separated from the supercontinent Gondwana between 79 to 83 million years ago. Scientists claim that it's the thinnest and youngest continent discovered underwater. Creighton is a core rock that acts as the main foundation for most continents. It's at least a billion years old, but the continental crust that makes up Zealandia is just half of that, which makes it quite young. That means some Creighton is missing, even though it holds some leftovers of older rocks and parts of the mantle. They're estimated to be as old as 2.7 billion years old. Scientists did some studies on the zircon crystals from New Zealand and found out that they're as old as 1.3 billion years old. The rest of the continents are more than 3 billion years old. Scientists studied the composition of the rocks in the bottom of the ocean around New Zealand. They're made up of silica and granite, which are found in continental crusts. The ocean floors mainly have magnesium and iron-rich rocks. They're also thicker and higher than regular ocean crusts around it. They conducted some studies and collected magnetic and topographic data to see the link between the Tasman and Coral Seas in the Cato Trough region. This is the narrow strip between Zealandia and Australia. Satellite data tracked tiny faults in the Earth's gravity to map out the crust of the ocean floor surrounding the area. They saw the mass that makes up Zealandia quite visible and almost the size of Australia. Even though the signs are there, this doesn't prove anything. It's possible that there are a bunch of microcontinents which all split apart when Australia broke free of Gondwana. Back then, the supercontinent was made up of South America, Antarctica, Australia, Zealandia, Arabia, and the Indian subcontinent. New Zealand is already not the biggest country out there, but if the theories are correct, then Zealandia will be six times its original size. Mauritius is a young island that's only a few million years old. Just 1,200 miles off the coast of Africa, it's believed that the tiny island came to life around 9 million years ago. The underwater volcanoes in the region spewed out so much lava that it formed the land today. But scientists found zircon rocks that are more than 3 billion years old. It may also be part of a continent submerged underwater called Mauritia, which is just a quarter of the size of Madagascar. The zircons they found were embedded in solid rocks and not just in the sand which may rule out that they just washed up on shore from another continent. Some scientists are still not convinced. They suggest that discovering rocks that stand out from the other typical ones brought by an eruption could skew the scientific community to this theory. But just like how Icelandia could be part of Greater Icelandia, Mauritia was once called Rodinia, which consisted of India and Madagascar. Theories suggest that Mauritia was covered in water when India broke away from Madagascar, something like 85 million years ago. Meteorites rain down on Earth every single year. Almost 63% of the 69,268 meteorites scientists have officially recorded in the Meteoritical Bulletin database have been picked up from a polar desert. From where? Antarctica. It's technically a desert because it gets little precipitation. The continent receives an average equivalent of about 6 inches of water annually, mostly from snow. 
the interior parts are even drier. Not much action happens to meteorites there. Deserts are like safe storage closets for them, and it's easier to spot meteorites there. In total, there are around 42,000 meteorites in Antarctica. Most of them have been spotted since 1976. The Sahara Desert in Africa isn't far behind. Nomads and treasure hunters have discovered over 14,000 meteorites there, especially since 1995. Then there's the Arabian Peninsula, mainly Oman, where they've unearthed about 4,200 meteorites. So why does Antarctica take the crown for its meteorite collection compared to other areas? It's not because more meteorites land there. Statistically, they can land anywhere. Antarctica wins because it's great at showing off these space rocks. The icy environment keeps them in mint condition. The contrast between the ice and space rocks makes spotting meteorites easy. Plus, there are spots called meteorite stranding zones, where the geology, ice flow, and climate team up to gather meteorites. Here's the sci-fi part. Satellites help researchers find meteorites. They use these space gadgets to spot the best places to search. Some of these meteorites are ancient, like a million years old. Now, when you think about how many meteorites there are, it's a bit like a pie chart. If you measure their weight, instead of just counting them, things get interesting. Antarctica's slice of the pie gets smaller. On average, an Antarctic meteorite weighs about 2 ounces, like a small bar of chocolate. Ooh, chocolate. But in the Sahara, they've got all sizes, so the average is about a pound. Now, let's talk about meteorites in action. Only a tiny bit, maybe just 1.8% of all meteorites found have been seen falling. These are called falls. Clever name. Meteorite detectives, or meteoriticists, get all excited when they see that. The other 98% are finds. Someone stumbled upon them without seeing the meteorite take its cosmic leap. So when we only look at the ones that fell from the sky, most are called stony meteorites. These are like regular fellas of the meteorite world, but there's also a special kind called iron meteorites, or just irons. There are also super rare meteorites, called mesositerites and pelocities, that are like a mix of metal and regular rock stuff. In places where humans live, like North America, people tend to find more iron meteorites than those that fell. That's because iron ones are usually bigger and more eye-catching. Farmers found some of these while they were working in their fields. Oh, surprise! A bunch of gigantic iron meteorites from places like China, Namibia, and the US make the chart slices huge. Now, check out this adventure. A group of scientists braving the crazy cold of Antarctica's icy desert to uncover some fresh meteorites found what they had been looking for. In fact, one of the meteorites weighed almost 17 pounds. The ones like that are pretty huge. Do they have an impact on Earth? Science says yes, they do. Meteorite impacts are more common than you think. About 17 meteorites smack Earth's surface every single day. Since most of the planet is covered with water, there are loads of places without people around. That's why these hits often go unnoticed. Most meteorites are just small bits zipping through our atmosphere anyway. By the time they touch down, they get tiny thanks to all the friction against the air. Not all meteorite impacts are wimpy. Some supersized ones have rocked our world. Remember when dinosaurs said bye-bye? Yeah, that might have been the fault of a huge asteroid. These meteorite hits are random, and they happen all the time. Scientists have uncovered evidence of a massive meteor impact even before the famous dinosaur wipeout. This impact is thought to have triggered the biggest extinction event in Earth's history. The 300-mile-wide impact crater is chilling over a mile beneath the East Antarctic ice sheet. This mega-event occurred about 250 million years ago. The epicenter of the crater is in the Wilkesland area of East Antarctica. It might have started the breakup of the Gondwana supercontinent. It was a big landmass that included parts of what are now South America, Africa, Antarctica, Australia, and more. So, the Gondwana supercontinent started to chip off by creating a tectonic rift that pushed Australia northward. This Wilkesland impact 
surpasses the one that led to the dinosaur's extinction in terms of scale and could have caused catastrophic consequences at the time. The Hoba meteorite is a huge junk of space stuff chilling on Earth. It crash-landed about 80,000 years ago in Namibia. The thing is a heavyweight, like twice the size of the next biggest meteorite ever found. Interestingly, it also has a weird flat shape. Nobody's moved it since it fell, so we really don't know how deep it's hidden. But experts think it's skidded along ground like a stone skipping on a lake because it landed at an angle. That's why it didn't leave a big crater when it hit the ground. And it was discovered by chance. A farmer found the world's biggest single meteorite. He was plowing his field with an ox and a regular plow. Suddenly, he heard a scraping noise. It was the metal plow meeting the iron meteorite. The Mosey meteorite from Tanzania has been staying underground for centuries before scientists gave it a proper look. The locals loved this space gem, calling it Commando. It was known in town for generations. Mosey is made of the same stuff as its other meteorite friends on Earth – about 90% iron and 8% nickel. It weighs 25 tons. Let's talk about the El Chaco meteorite, part of the Campo del Cielo meteorite crew in Argentina. Imagine an almost 24-square-mile playground for space rocks. El Chaco, weighing 37 tons, decided to show up fashionably late in 1969. So what if you found a meteorite? How can you tell for sure that it's not just some random rock? These space visitors have a few features that make them stand out from regular rocks. Firstly, meteorites are often heavier than they look because they're packed with heavy metals and dense materials. Secondly, most meteorites have some metallic iron, so magnets usually stick to them. If you've got a rock that's not magnetic, try suspending the magnet from a string. The third clue lies in their unusual shapes. Iron-nickel meteorites aren't smooth and round. Stony meteorites usually have a thin, crispy crust on the outside. It looks as if their surface melted a bit while moving through the atmosphere. Sounds like pizza to me. Suppose these tips won't help on your quest. Then consider this. Light-colored crystals are not meteorites. Those pretty things, like quartz, are common on Earth. But they don't hang out on other planets or moons in our solar system. Do you know those bubbly holes in volcanic rocks or melted metal slag on Earth? Meteorites don't have those either. Plus, scratching a meteorite shouldn't leave a mark. But if you scratch a dense rock and get a dark or red mark, the rock contains minerals like magnetite or hematite, which meteorites don't usually have. If you suspect finding a meteor in your backyard or something, try these tips. Just remember, to be sure, you've got to give rocks and minerals a real-life look from experts. And if you see one falling towards you, always remember to duck. Let me take you to a place that seems to be out of this world. Life inside this cave has been isolated from the outside world for about 5.5 million years. And it does show. See for yourself. Due to such a long isolation, the conditions inside the Mobile Cave are like nowhere else on our planet. A unique ecosystem is flourishing there, even though there is a severe lack of sunlight inside the cave, and the air is toxic. The cave, located a few miles west of the Black Sea in Romania, was first discovered in 1986. Nowadays, you can only visit it if you have special permission. Plus, the central caverns are guarded naturally by narrow limestone tunnels and vertical shafts. So, if you're no stranger to claustrophobia, you'd probably better not enter this place. In the depth of the cave, the air has twice less oxygen than the air outside. Instead, it contains a lot of carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide, so not the freshest air you can breathe. It's also pitch black inside the cavern. But despite, or should I say thanks to, this cocktail of extremely harsh conditions, the site is a true goldmine for biologists. Shockingly, life seems to be booming here. In a 1996 study, scientists identified 48 species, and 33 of them were unique to the cave. Most of the creatures inhabiting the cave are tiny, with long limbs and antennae that help them navigate in the dark. They have no vision and lack pigment, and it makes sense. 
Why would you need to be able to see if you live in total darkness? And why would you need to be pretty and colorful with no one to see you? Now I'm going to take you to another cave. It's no less amazing, but looks very different. This is the giant crystal cave, AKA the cave of the crystals in Mexico. These ginormous crystals were found in 2000 by a mining company after the water was pumped out of the cave. Two miners then saw the crystals after entering the drying cave on foot. These awe-inspiring crystals are actually massive gypsum pillars hidden 984 feet underground. They're anchored to the walls and the floor of the scorching hot cave. Scientists estimate that the crystals could have been already growing for half a million years. That's why many of them are so long and wide that you can walk across them. Unfortunately, visiting this wonder of nature is impossible at the moment. But maybe it's for the better since the giant crystal cave is a dangerous place that can easily turn into a trap. For tens of thousands of years, it was filled with groundwater, which was originally pushed upward into the opening by a magma chamber located in the depths of our planet. The magma under the cave kept the water hot, but eventually the temperature of the water dipped below 136 degrees Fahrenheit. As a result, the water started to fill with calcium and sulfate, whose particles began to recombine into gypsum. And then, white tinted crystals took over the cave. And since they stayed underwater, they were able to keep growing. You don't have to fly to space to take a closer look at a black hole. Scientists have found something very similar to black holes in the Southern Atlantic Ocean. A black hole has such an enormous gravitational pull that once something gets pulled inside, it doesn't have any chance to escape. Even light can't get out of a black hole. But ocean black holes seem to be almost as powerful as their space relatives. But instead of catching the light, they do the same with water. Ocean eddies are massive whirlpools that spin against the main current. They usually swirl billions of tons of water and most of them are larger than a city. These whirlpools are so powerful that nothing trapped by them can escape. But the scariest thing is that you might not even notice heading into one of them. These things are so huge that you won't spot their boundaries until it's too late. When scientists started exploring ocean vortices with the help of satellites, they discovered the borders of several eddies. After that, they managed to prove that, mathematically, these whirlpools are the same as mysterious black holes in space. Massive eddies are surrounded by super tight barriers where fluid moves in closed loops. Even water can't get out from the inside of these loops. That's why tight ocean vortices play the role of enormous containers. Water inside them can be totally different from the ocean surrounding an eddy. And I'm not only talking about its temperature. The salt content inside and outside a whirlpool often differs as well. On the thin Curonian spit splitting the Baltic Sea from the Curonian Lagoon, there is one of the most bizarre places on Earth. Locals call this area the Dancing Forest because pine trees in this forest have shockingly unusual shapes. They twist in spirals and circles along the ground. There are some theories why it could be happening, of course. Some people claim that huge amounts of positive and negative energies once clashed in that spot. More down-to-earth individuals believe that the reason is geological. Sandy soil in the area is too unstable to hold trees growing upright. The most popular is the idea that strong winds blowing from the water influence the shape of the trees. In any case, experts haven't come to the final conclusion yet. Look at these underwater crop circles. For the first time, they were spotted in 1995, close to southern Japan's coast. Local divers called these seven feet wide structures mystery circles. The enigma had been plaguing many mines for almost 16 years until the culprit was finally caught. Imagine the researcher's surprise when it turned out to be a male pufferfish. The fish needs a bit more than a week to build one circle, and the aesthetics are obviously crucial. A male is swimming inside the circle, digging valleys in the sand with its fins. But that's not all. The fish also use shells and corals to decorate particular parts of their circles. This whole build a circle thing has a practical purpose as well. The way a male fish swims pushes the sand toward the center of the circle and creates a mound which later serves as a nest. The next mystery on our list is in the Caribbean. Just off the coast of Belize, there's a giant sinkhole. That's the Great Blue Hole. It's about 1,000 feet across and more than 400 feet deep. Once, a long, long time ago, this hole was a cave. 
but then rising waters filled it, making it collapse in on itself. The deeper you'll descend into the Great Hole's crystalline waters, the darker it will become. You'll see tons of stalactite-filled caves there, but entering them is extremely dangerous, unless you want to get hopelessly lost. Once you reach a depth of 50 feet, you'll notice that the water is shimmering. That's the invisible line dividing the sinkhole's salty top from the freshwater abyss. You might want to turn back right now. Who knows what you might come across in the murky depths. There was an old Amazonian legend that told about the river that was so hot that it boiled. And it was believed to be just a legend until Peruvian geoscientist Andres Ruzo questioned if the river could be real. All experts denied such a possibility. After all, hot rivers do exist, but only in the areas where there are volcanoes. As for the part of the country mentioned in the legend, there are no volcanoes in that region. But Andres Russo was too dedicated to give up. And in 2011, he finally located the river from the legends. The water in it was indeed steaming hot. Its temperature was 186 degrees Fahrenheit, not boiling, but pretty close to this point. But what shocked the researcher the most was the size of the river. One could think that the almost boiling water was the result of the activity of an underwater hot spring. But thermal pools are always small, while the river is 20 feet deep and flows for almost 4 miles. This is the only river of its kind on our planet. It was one of the biggest creatures ever to roam the Earth. It was longer than your average school bus and could easily weigh more than 10 elephants combined. But where did it live? How did it end up having this size? And most importantly, why is it extinct nowadays? Let's find out. The Megalodon was the largest predator ever known in our planet's history. In terms of its location, the Megalodon lived practically in all waters on our globe, except near the poles. The reason why there were no Megalodon teeth found in Antarctica is probably that the gigantic creature adapted to only warm tropical and subtropical waters. The younger ones liked to keep to the shores, while full-grown adults preferred coastal areas. But they could easily move into the open ocean as well. How do we know the Megalodon was so widely spread? We can only presume based on the fact that they discovered the most northern fossils off the coast of Denmark and the most southern in New Zealand. The discussion of how the Megalodon got this size is still open in the scientific community. They recently found out that not all the specimens from this fascinating species reach the same huge size. This has to do with a little something called the Bergman's Rule, which says that the temperature of the surrounding environment affects the animal's body size because they either need to conserve or shed heat. The megalodons that reach cooler waters probably needed more body weight to make sure they survived in low temperatures. On the contrary, those living in warmer waters had to be smaller to avoid burning up. But what did this enormous fish look like? Most modern depictions show the megalodon resembling an enormous great white shark. But well, it seems it may not necessarily be correct. The megalodon likely had a much shorter nose and a flatter jaw that looked almost squashed when compared with a great white shark. It also seems to have something in common with the modern blue shark extra-long pectoral fins. They needed these to support their weight and size while navigating the planet's waters. Lastly, the lady megalodons ooh, seem to have been about twice as large as the gentlemen. As for their offspring, even a small megalodon was enormous, at least 6.5 feet from nose to tail. How do we know that? Because specialists have stumbled upon megalodon nursery habitats in Panama, Maryland, the Canary Islands, and Florida. Even the piles of used diapers were enormous. Nah, not really. Surely the scariest aspect of the megalodon's looks was its mouth. I mean, think about it. Megalodon had whales for dinner, so it obviously needed to open its mouth wide enough. Scientists have estimated that its jaw would span a mind-boggling size, 9 by 11 feet wide. Just to paint you a better picture, that means it could have easily gulped down two adult people side by side. Wait, which two adults? Those impressive jaws also feature 276 teeth. Based on modern reconstructions of the force of its bite, it looks like it may have been one of the most, if not the most, powerful animals of prey ever to exist in. For comparison, humans can have a bite force of around 1,300 newtons. Today, great white sharks have been estimated to be able to bite down with a force of over 18,000 newtons. 
the Megalodon tops all the records, with an estimated power of bite up to 10 times greater than that. It could basically crush a car with very little effort. Its teeth were also pretty amazing. Similar to sharks, the Megalodon was fast in replacing its broken or worn teeth. With four or five rows of teeth in its mouth, it basically acted like a conveyor belt, growing back damaged or missing teeth within about 48 hours. This means that an adult Megalodon probably would have grown several thousand teeth throughout its lifetime. It was nice of them to do that, though, since it's probably one of the reasons why Megalodon teeth are so common in fossil records and were able to study them properly. To maintain its impressive physique, the Megalodon had to eat somewhere around 2,500 pounds of food per day. Can't wrap your head around that? Well, it was the equivalent of one and a quarter cows per day to survive. It's like if you had to eat 3,300 cans of tuna every day. I've used the word Megalodon a lot, but have I mentioned where it comes from? When translated from Greek, it means giant tooth. Ah, those clever Greeks. However, this giant shark's full scientific name is a bit more complicated, Carcharocles Megalodon. But are these gigantic predators actually extinct? We tend to believe so, but let's be honest for a second. We've come to know more about the surface of Mars than the depths of our oceans. Like, we've only explored 15% of our oceans altogether. Who knows what may be lying out there in the deep? Maybe some ancient predators? The Mariana Trench is the deepest oceanic trench on Earth. The Challenger Deep, its deepest part, is so deep that you could dip the whole of Mount Everest in there and it would still be over a mile above the surface. That's deep. If a megalodon or two ever needed a place to crash, that would be a discreet enough location. However, the Mariana Trench is not a particularly comfy place to be in. You know, because it's cold and steeped in total darkness and all. The temperatures here are around 36 degrees Fahrenheit all year round. And to top it all off, the pressure is a thousand times stronger than at sea level. So it's safe to assume that if any megalodon is hiding in here, its teeth and bones might not be looking so good. Because of the intense pressure here in the Mariana Trench, proteins and calcium start to dissolve and disintegrate. That's why, for example, the Haddell snailfish, the deepest dwelling fish we've discovered, has evolved to feature flexible cartilage instead of bones. To survive here, the megalodon would also need to learn to navigate in complete darkness. That means it would have to either become luminescent or evolve to grow massive eyes like the giant squid. While it may sound like an intriguing and good idea for a movie script, most scientists don't think it's possible. Why? Well, most of them say it's because of the megalodon's size. Most foods that megalodons like to eat live in shallow ocean areas and not in the deep, deep sea. Specialists believe that if these animals were actually still roaming our waters, there's no way we wouldn't know about it. They would need to come up for dinner every now and then, right? Their food is also the most likely cause of why the megalodon is not alive anymore. While some specialists believe the megalodon became extinct because of a drop in the ocean water temperature, most scientists suggested that the shifting food chain dynamics may have been more to blame. Why? Because at some point, there was less and less of its primary food source, baleen whales. And at the same time, the numbers of its natural competitors, like smaller predatory sharks like the great white shark and whales, increased. The megalodon did live on this planet a lot more than we did, and way back when we didn't even exist yet. They were here for nearly 70 times longer than we, modern humans, have, inhabiting the oceans for around 20 million years. Homo sapiens appeared around 300,000 years ago. The megalodon managed to survive for so long mostly because of its unbeatable size. I mean, they can make a meal out of almost everything in the sea at the time. We may think about both of them as prehistoric creatures, but the megalodons and the dinosaurs never coexisted on Earth. The dinosaurs probably died out about 66 million years ago. Megalodons seem to have appeared a bit later. That's because the oldest megalodon fossils we have yet discovered are from the Miocene epoch, which began 23 million years ago. So long, Meg!
Scientists claim that Icelandia was a region between Greenland and Scandinavia that was more than 230,000 square miles but is now underwater. The Earth was once a large pizza pie with all the continents connected to each other millions of years ago, otherwise known as Pangaea. The North Atlantic region we know today was dry land from about 335 million to 175 million years ago. For many years, scientists and geologists assumed that the North Atlantic Ocean was birthed as Pangaea began to split apart roughly 200 million years ago. With volcanoes in the region where Iceland is, the country came to be just 60 million years ago as it broke off and sailed away from all the other lands. And since the Earth was like a large pizza pie, it divided like one. Many of the lands split up into many large and small pieces, creating the continents we know today. But this new theory suggests that the result of Pangaea's splitting left out some land that stretched for around 200 miles. And just about 10 million years ago, that piece of land submerged in the waters on the eastern and western side leaving the tip of the land, which is now Iceland. When plate tectonics move, they grind on each other, which gave shape to our current landscape, all thanks to the mantle. This new radical theory goes against everything written in history books and what scientists have been studying. They began shaking heads, drawing lots of skepticism and criticism. But by analyzing the ocean floor under Iceland and the Earth's crust, we can assume that this idea isn't far-fetched. The crust beneath Iceland happens to be a lot thicker than the typical ones. Oceanic crust is made up of unique melted rocks compared to the land crusts where we walk and live on, and is a lot more denser. The thinnest layer on Earth is the crust, where life takes place. It's essential for water, growing food, gathering natural resources and minerals, and breathing in oxygen. It sinks below to the bottom, but right above the Earth's mantle. It also refreshes itself, since it constantly gets recycled into the mantle and back up. This is why the rocks in the oceanic crust are around 25 miles thick, compared to just 5 miles anywhere else. This is also reasonable, given that it's in a hot spot for volcanoes. Magnetic surveys of the ocean floor show layers of molten crust in stripe patterns. Also given the fact that the Earth's magnetic field changed its polarity over millions of years, it played a role in shaping the foundation of our landscape. But there isn't any hmm. concrete evidence to prove this new theory just yet. One of the first steps is to start digging the ocean floor near Iceland. Zircon is a very sturdy mineral that can last for billions of years despite erosion in the Earth's crust. By taking samples and studying them, researchers can estimate the geological age of the continents. This will make sure the crust is oceanic, which is thicker, or continental, which is the regular crust we walk on. This isn't an overnight project and would come with a hefty cost. Another way is to do seismic surveys that can measure echoes conducted on research ships. Drilling holes miles deep in the crust can also help with the research. But this would cost more than studying the zircon minerals. Some fossilized plants unique to both Scandinavia and Greenland might prove that Icelandia was once on the surface and possibly scattered with trees. It wasn't a cold land as it is today, so it may have had forests. But scientists still haven't found fossil evidence of animals common in both lands to suggest anything. But maybe time will tell. The theory goes deeper, which suggests that there was a greater Icelandia. With Iceland, Ireland, Britain, Scandinavia, and Greenland all in one microcontinent, it could be a destination of winter enthusiasts and great for skiing. It could be possible to connect Canada to Greater Icelandia by train over the ocean, which would open up the economy even more. Iceland is around 40,000 square miles, which is already quite big. And if the Greater Icelandia was present today, then Europe would be a completely different continent. Many theories are circulating about other possible hidden microcontinents around the world. 
Scientists aren't certain of the possibility of Icelandia's existence. But if all the studies conducted were done correctly, then the theory could change everything we know about Iceland and the North Atlantic Ocean. And this could pave the way for other sunken microcontinents around the world. Another theory out there is that New Zealand was the tip of a lost subcontinent, even bigger than Icelandia, called Zealandia. Studies show that it separated from the supercontinent Gondwana between 79 to 83 million years ago. Scientists claim that it's the thinnest and youngest continent discovered underwater. Creighton is a core rock that acts as the main foundation for most continents. It's at least a billion years old, but the continental crust that makes up Zealandia is just half of that, which makes it quite young. That means some Creighton is missing, even though it holds some leftovers of older rocks and parts of the mantle. They're estimated to be as old as 2.7 billion years old. Scientists did some studies on the zircon crystals from New Zealand and found out that they're as old as 1.3 billion years old. The rest of the continents are more than 3 billion years old. Scientists studied the composition of the rocks in the bottom of the ocean around New Zealand. They're made up of silica and granite, which are found in continental crusts. The ocean floors mainly have magnesium and iron-rich rocks. They're also thicker and higher than regular ocean crusts around it. They conducted some studies and collected magnetic and topographic data to see the link between the Tasman and Coral Seas in the Cato Trough region. This is the narrow strip between Zealandia and Australia. Satellite data tracked tiny faults in the Earth's gravity to map out the crust of the ocean floor surrounding the area. They saw the mass that makes up Zealandia quite visible and almost the size of Australia. Even though the signs are there, this doesn't prove anything. It's possible that there are a bunch of microcontinents which all split apart when Australia broke free of Gondwana. Back then, the supercontinent was made up of South America, Antarctica, Australia, Zealandia, Arabia, and the Indian subcontinent. New Zealand is already not the biggest country out there, but if the theories are correct, then Zealandia will be six times its original size. Mauritius is a young island that's only a few million years old. Just 1,200 miles off the coast of Africa, it's believed that the tiny island came to life around 9 million years ago. The underwater volcanoes in the region spewed out so much lava that it formed the land today. But scientists found zircon rocks that are more than 3 billion years old. It may also be part of a continent submerged underwater called Mauritia, which is just a quarter of the size of Madagascar. The zircons they found were embedded in solid rocks and not just in the sand, which may rule out that they just washed up on shore from another continent. Some scientists are still not convinced. They suggest that discovering rocks that stand out from the other typical ones brought by an eruption could skew the scientific community to this theory. But just like how Icelandia could be part of Greater Icelandia, Mauritia was once called Rodinia, which consisted of India and Madagascar. Theories suggest that Mauritia was covered in water when India broke away from Madagascar, something like 85 million years ago. Your geography teacher must have told you there are seven continents in the world. In 2017, scientists made an announcement that changed this universal truth, the discovery of Zealandia. They called for a change in world maps and provided us with some proof, of course. First off, let's take a look at the ocean floor near New Zealand. The continental shelves of this mysterious continent are chilling at a depth of around 3,280 feet below sea level. The nearby oceanic crust dives even deeper at 9,800 feet below that. All of that is giving us those continent vibes, with varying altitudes from deep below the ocean to the majestic Mount Cook, standing tall at 12,217 feet above sea level. Brave geologists have gone deep down to collect rocks from the ocean floor. They found that unlike the nearby oceanic crust, which is made up of fresh basaltic rocks, the crust around New Zealand is one impressive mix. We're talking granite, limestone, sandstone, and some ancient rock types that are incredibly ancient. 
All this screams continental crust. Finally, scientists have discovered a narrow strip of oceanic crust that separates Australia from the hidden land of Zealandia. It means these two are separate continents. 85 million years ago, Zealandia decided to break free from the supercontinent Gondwana. Millions of years later, the Earth's tectonic plates, those puzzle pieces that make up our planet's crust, started throwing a wild party. The mighty Pacific Plate, the heavyweight champion of tectonic plates, decided to take a dive beneath Zealandia's continental crust. This process is called subduction. As a result, the root of Zealandia, that connection to its continental crust, broke off and went into the depths below. So you see now that it takes millions of years and a lot of action for a new continent to form. But what if the impossible happened and a new continent formed overnight in the Pacific Ocean? The next morning, you'd probably spill your morning coffee while watching the news. For this newfound land to be considered a full-fledged continent, it needs to have a surface area like Zealandia and be a large, uninterrupted chunk of land with some water surrounding it. And here comes the twist. The Pacific Ocean has an average depth of 13,000 feet. So if a continent wanted to join the party, it would have to push a whole lot of rock upward, shaping its way to the surface. A new continent emerging overnight would make sea levels skyrocket. We'd have to say goodbye to geographically low-lying countries like Bangladesh, Senegal, and the Netherlands. The ocean currents would be in for a wild ride too. The North Pacific subtropical gyre, a vibrant hotspot for marine life, would be thrown off balance. Those poor marine creatures who rely on the currents for their journeys would need some new source of navigation. Plus, the creatures that live permanently in one place could lose their main food source. Oceans are like global free-for-alls, but with a new continent in play, the countries situated nearby would be willing to stake their claim on this unexpected landmass. This new continent would be a blank canvas. No lush landscapes or freshwater sources, just rock and more rock. So if you are dreaming of relocating to this novelty, you have to wait for some serious terraforming to make it habitable. But for now, let's go back to the real new continent of Zealandia. It's actually a microcontinent, which is an official word for a landmass that has separated from a main continent. In our case, it was Antarctica and then Australia. You could say Zealandia is a bit shy, with only up to 7% of its size peaking above the water surface. But it's nearly 70% as large as Australia in total and proudly boasts of two major islands we know and love as New Zealand, the North Island and the South Island. Plus, there are many smaller islets. The largest islands have glaciers, like the famous Tasman Glacier on the South Island, Thanks to some glacial action in the past, Zealandia can show off its fjords and valleys. New Caledonia has a tropical vibe with its Oceania and South Pacific connections. The unofficial eighth continent is a hotspot for geological action. Part of it belongs to the Australian plate, while the rest rides the Pacific plate. It has six major areas with active volcanoes. And don't forget the geothermal treats Geysers and hot springs are scattered all over the place, courtesy of the Australian and Pacific plates having a steamy interaction. The underwater world of Zealandia is a treasure chest of mineral deposits and natural gas fields. It's also a scientific playground. During those icy glacial periods, sea levels dropped and more of Zealandia emerged from the depths. The fossils this process left behind are like an encyclopedia of valuable clues about the life that thrived here during ancient times. The search for Zealandia lasted for 375 years. It all started in 1642, when Dutch seafarer and explorer Abel Tasman set on a mission from Jakarta, Indonesia. Back in the day, Europeans were sure that there had to be a massive land down under to balance out their own continent up north. They even had a fancy name for it, Terra Australis. Tasman was determined to become the first to find it. He went west, then south, then east, all the way to the South Island of New Zealand. But here's where things took a turn for the worst. 
the local Maori people, who had been living there for centuries, didn't exactly roll out the red carpet. They rammed one of Tasman's small boats, and sadly, four of the Europeans met their ends. What happened next remains a mystery. But a few weeks later, Tasman sailed back home without ever stepping foot on this mysterious land he believed to be the great southern continent. He never came back. The explorer didn't even realize that he was actually right all along about the existence of a missing continent. And you already know it only became official in 2017. Another lost and found continent isn't hiding in the ocean, but under Europe. It's called the Greater Adria, and it collided with Europe and started to sink under it around 140 million years ago. Today, it lies beneath Italy, Greece, and the Baltics. Its size and even shape match that of Greenland, the world's largest island. Greater Adria is no longer visible, but it left some clues. Parts of it were embedded in the Alps. Other chucks were incorporated into present-day Italy and Croatia on the other side of the Adriatic Sea. Limestone rocks from the former continent started to change once they were under the European landmass. Tremendous heat and pressure spread over tens of millions of years changed their structure. Out goes the limestone, in comes the marble. All the Greek and Roman temples you admired on your summer vacation were constructed using this marble. It was sort of a going away gift from a long lost continent. You don't notice this, but our planet never stops moving and it happens deep beneath our feet. 120 million years ago, Australia and Antarctica were a single piece of land. They went their separate ways, but Antarctica didn't leave empty-handed. Today, there is an oceanic plateau in the Indian Ocean. Long ago, it was connected to another lost continent, the Kerguelen microcontinent. Scientists believe that it made a land bridge between India and Antarctica. To find out what it was like, we can look at a tiny archipelago in the southern Indian Ocean. These islands are all that is left of the ancient landmass. They have a cold climate and feature glaciers because they're so close to Antarctica. But in the past, the climate must have been temperate with plenty of rainfall. The animals and plants would have been similar to those that we find in tropical regions today. The lost continent landscape was probably much like that of New Zealand. Our planet keeps changing, and at some point, all the continents will reconnect with each other forming one supercontinent again. And maybe then, future humans will wonder, what if our continent broke into pieces tomorrow? Antarctica is the most remote continent on the planet. It has 90% of the world's ice, but it's considered a desert because the annual rainfall is only about eight inches. You'd probably never think it was a desert if you look at it, since it's white and full of wildlife. But Antarctica is not only what it appears to be on the surface. There is so much hidden beneath it, and even above it. Atlantis has long been a mystery for humankind. Did it ever exist? And if yes, where was it located? One of the theories supports that the Atlantean civilization could have thrived and flourished in the Antarctic continent when it was still uncovered by ice. Due to the Earth's cyclical eras, this is the periods of ice and interglacial periods. It was believed that Antarctica was actually a tropical forest. And, well, a recent Google Earth picture found some interesting ruins buried deep within a lake bed on the icy continent. It's unclear to which civilization these remains belong to, but some theorists believe that it could perfectly be Atlantis and these frozen Antarctic lakes are holding much more under them. In the 1970s, scientists were surprised to find large lakes under the ice plaques in the frozen continent. Over 400 lake beds are believed to exist under layers of ice. Lake Vostok, for instance, the largest subglacial lake over there, is buried beneath two miles of thick ice. There are pristine blue ice caves hidden under there as well. The water in these lakes remains liquid due to the small levels of geothermal heat from the Earth's core. And some scientists believe that some lakes are around 15 million years old. Talk about the old days, huh? 
Now, amongst the unique phenomena that occur in the continent, let's say Antarctica is home to an extremely weird waterfall. The year was 1911 when Australian geologists wondered about the so-called Blood Falls. He was extremely puzzled by this red stream of liquid pouring from a small hillside amongst the Antarctic ice. After years of studying it, it was understood what caused the redness was the high iron content in the water. The last piece of the puzzle came when scientists discovered that there was an underground lake with water full of oxidized iron nearby, which was what caused the blood fall to exist in the first place. And speaking of puzzles, this image might be quite puzzling. After all, why on earth would anyone need to take cash to Antarctica? Well, a little history first. Back in 1956, the U.S. founded McMurdo Research Station, which is the biggest science hub in the continent to date. At its peak, the McMurdo Station hosts from 200 to 1,000 scientists. And these people need money to buy coffee, pizza, and other things to meet their daily needs. That's when Wells Fargo decided to install an ATM there. Oh, and they even set a Guinness World Record this way. The Wells Fargo ATM at McMurdo Station is the most southern one in the world. And it's the loneliest ATM in the world as well, as there isn't another one for hundreds and hundreds of miles. The freezing temperatures in Antarctica can make the continent hostile to human life. Actually, Antarctica is the coldest, driest, and windiest continent on our planet. The average temperature along the coast is around 14 degrees Fahrenheit. But as you head towards the Antarctic hinterlands, it gets even colder than that. The interior of the continent can register temperatures of around negative 71 degrees Fahrenheit. On the bright side, these freezing conditions can account for some mesmerizing phenomena, such as ice bubbles. These bubbles frozen inside some Antarctic lakes are bubbles of methane gas. The gas released from the melting of glaciers ends up freezing midway and makes for a beautiful and exotic scene. I guess methane never looked this pretty before, did it? A few years ago, scientists were taken aback by a giant hole the size of the Netherlands in one Antarctic lake. For scale, that's more or less the size of Lake Michigan. These holes are called polinias, and they are a natural phenomenon in the continent. However, this one is the biggest scientists have ever seen since the 1970s. So you'll understand, polinias are massive holes in a sea of ice. Most of them occur along the continent's coast, but this new one was found in the Weddell Sea, much farther from the shore. Scientists are still trying to understand how that happened and what its implications are for the climate in the region. There's one feature in the continent that looks completely man-made and has even sparked several theories around the world regarding its origins. I mean, this formation looks exactly like other man-made pyramids, doesn't it? The only difference is that this is actually a natural rock formation and has existed for a very long time. It was first found during an expedition in the 1910s and was kept secret ever since. It was nicknamed Pyramid, but its correct scientific name is Nunatak, which is simply a peak of rock sticking out above a glacier or an ice sheet. There are other famous peaks that look pyramid-shaped, such as the Matterhorn in Switzerland. So no, this really isn't a human construction, we're sure of it. And the list of fascinating discoveries on the ice continent goes on. An artificial intelligence program was analyzing a set of data on Antarctica when it came across a stunning discovery. There may be up to 300,000 undiscovered meteorites to be found in the icy field of the continent. The truth is, meteorites have been falling on the continent for millions of years. But it was only 110 years ago that the first one was found. And guess what? Recently, researchers found a Martian meteorite in East Antarctica. It was the biggest one found in the last 25 years, and it weighed about 165 pounds. 
Now, usually fire and ice are rather a tricky combination, so I'm guessing you wouldn't say that Antarctica hosts an active volcano, right? But it does. The volcano, known as Mount Erebus, is the southernmost active volcano in the world with liquid magma and lava boiling for eons. Actually, Mount Erebus has been active for over a million years, and it's Antarctica's second highest volcano with a height of 12,000 feet. We've mentioned before that Antarctica wasn't always icy, but could you imagine a huge rainforest covering the entire continent? This isn't science fiction, it's actually true. Leaf impressions and fossilized wood clearly show signs of tropical trees in the region. Fossil research has also revealed something magnificent. Antarctica is home to the oldest worm in the world. According to National Geographic, sperm fossils found in Antarctica reveal a long extinct species of worm that is around 50 million years old. Scientists claim that this discovery is beyond important to studying some evolutionary relationships and say that this was only possible due to the freezing of such samples for thousands of years. Antarctica is a continent rich in biodiversity. Penguins, polar bears, and seals are just some of the animals we know that exist down there. But there is also a rare and fascinating species of fish that inhabits Antarctic waters. Popularly known as the see-through fish, this species is as bizarre as it is beautiful. This fish had to adapt to survive the cold water temperature in Antarctica, so much so that it evolved into a unique being. As well as a transparent body, this fish has transparent blood, making it completely see-through. This is because they lack the protein hemoglobin, which gives blood its red color. Pretty neat, huh? When you think of Antarctica, you probably think of icebergs, right? So here are some fun facts about it. Did you know that icebergs have a lifespan of about 3,000 years? And that together with Greenland, Antarctica is one of the world's primary sources of icebergs. Icebergs can reach 600 to 700 feet below the surface of the water, and around 90% of an iceberg is hidden underwater. That's where the expression, tip of the iceberg, comes from. There's not much to do in Antarctica except scientific work. You could check out the wildlife, like some cute penguins and seals, and you'd get to see the occasional whale swimming around. Antarctica is one of the biggest lands out there that's only inhabited by scientists and researchers from all over the world. These scientists dug a hole through some pretty thick ice to study the ancient air and how the atmosphere cleans itself. They used a special drill and dug a clean cylindrical hole 450 feet below the surface. Some of this ice can be up to 800,000 years old and is a good indicator of what the climate was like in the past. It's like checking out tree rings to determine how old a certain tree is, except it's more complicated than that. After the effortless digging, they decided to drop some ice to the bottom of the hole to see what would happen next. They heard some really unusual sounds. It felt like being on a spaceship traveling through a bunch of obstacles with many rocks smashing into each other. The pitches changed over the quick descent of the block of ice, ranging from high pitch and ending with a low heartbeat-like sound. The scientists were puzzled when they first heard this and dropped some more ice, only to find out that the same type of sounds were being produced, just in different variations. They couldn't tell what was down there and, more importantly, why these kinds of sounds were produced. Antarctica boasts quite a few volcanoes, many of which are under super thick sheets of ice. Scientists discovered 91 volcanoes and claimed there could be more, potentially making it the most extensive volcanic region in the world. While they were doing regular scientific research, they came across many unmistakable large cone-shaped figures underground. Some were as deep as two miles in the ice. Some of the peaks were over 3,000 feet tall and dozens of miles across. But on the surface, it's as plain as a sheet of paper. They may have dropped that block of ice inside an actual volcano that they were standing on, but it's unlikely. 
even though the underground volcano presence was discovered by accident, there's a small chance they were actually standing on one where they had their workstation set up. It's more likely that they worked in an area where studying ancient climates is easier and less dangerous than other places. They collect ice samples and study them in a lab. It's like discovering a prehistoric insect embedded in amber millions of years ago when dinosaurs used to roam the land. But instead of little bugs, scientists study ancient dust, air bubbles, sea salts, volcanic ash, and anything else that may have come from the environment. They can practically tell how the climate was during that time. These ice samples might show that Antarctica's western ice sheet melted when the Earth's climate warmed up. If it did, then it's likely to happen again. That would mean sea levels rising, affecting coastal cities and small remote islands. But scientists aren't sure it's true, despite some evidence to back it up. The process of studying ice samples can take a week or even a year, depending on what they find. They crush or melt the sample bit by bit. And like those tree rings, the deeper the layer, the further we go back in time. In order to study ancient bubbles trapped in ice, researchers have to crush the samples under a vacuum hood to keep the air out while extracting the air and putting it in vials. There are various instruments and devices to study the ice samples, but because it's so sensitive to damage, each measurement must be in a clean room setting so that nothing gets compromised. The scientists have to wear proper body suits and many layers of gloves and constantly get ventilated. Even something as tiny and insignificant as a fingerprint can ruin a sample. They look for certain patterns to see changes in the atmosphere's composition and temperature. But dropping a few blocks of ice down a hole wouldn't be so bad. The reason why it made such a peculiar sound is the same reason why a moving car sounds different when it's honking than when it's stationary. The scientific word for it is the Doppler effect. It's an obvious change in the frequency of a wave with respect to an observer who is moving relative to the wave source. The effect doesn't mean the frequency of the sound changes, it just shifts. And this can be said about other types of waves, like water and light. But sound waves are the most popular ones when it comes to the Doppler effect. So, when the scientists dropped the ice block down the bottom of the hole, the sound waves traveled back up and bounced around the narrow tube where they drilled. That's why they got the pew pew sound. Let's not forget that this ice block traveled 450 feet beneath us. Oil ships dig holes in the oceanic crust that go thousands of feet beneath the Earth. The Kola Super Deep Borehole in Russia is the deepest hole ever made by humans. It goes more than 40,000 feet below the surface and took almost 20 years to reach 7.5 miles. Below it is only half the distance to the mantle. In terms of the whole Earth, this very deep hole is literally scratching the surface. This wasn't a hole to dig for oil and wasn't in the ocean either. The drilling was stopped in 1992 when the engineers found out that the temperatures were 100 degrees Fahrenheit higher than they predicted. And then it was abandoned, and it's just been a barren hole now. But that's the closest we've dug to the center of the planet. The scary thing is that some of the workers on the site could hear voices coming from within. All the way in Yemen, an ancient hole exists in Barhut, in the east of the country in the middle of the desert. It's actually closer to Oman than to the capital Sana'a. This hole has puzzled experts and locals. Unlike the holes in Russia and Antarctica, this wasn't man-made. Or was it? It's been around for many years, and the locals try to steer away from it. They don't even like talking about it, since they claim it brings bad luck to those around it or to whoever utters its name. They claim it was created as a prison for spirits, but many rule that out. The hole is 98 feet wide and somewhere between 330 to 650 feet deep. You can also hear strange sounds coming from the inside. But according to some scientists, the well has little to no ventilation and barely has any oxygen down there. So it's unlikely that anyone or anything lives down there. The Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench caught some low-pitched grumble sounds in March of 2016. Some of these grumbles were followed by screeches. They caught these sounds in a span of weeks, using a titanium-encased microphone so that the immense pressure of the lowest point on Earth wouldn't crush it. 
they had to lower it slowly as well, since it's 1,000 times the atmospheric pressure at sea level. For 23 whole days, the microphone recorded typical sounds of whales passing by and boats sailing across from above, and even rumbles of nearby earthquakes. But they still couldn't determine what caused those initial sounds. The researchers couldn't understand if the noise from the bottom of the Mariana Trench was caused by humans or was natural. They also wanted to know if these sounds affected marine life, like dolphins and whales that rely on echolocation. They still can't figure it out. But scientists estimate that the ocean is about 10 times noisier than it was 50 years ago. With technological developments in shipping, submarines, and underwater construction, the ocean will only get louder with time. Northern lights come with sounds, which nobody talks about. They're usually audible when the auroras are at their most powerful presence. Scientists were always puzzled as to what caused the faint popping and crackling even though they were very far above us. They used some special microphones and found out that the sounds came just 230 feet above us, which is pretty low. They're caused by electrical charges gaining power in a specific region of the auroras. The electrical charges are disturbed by magnetic storms that fire up the northern lights. As a result, some tiny sparks are released into the atmosphere, causing the faint crackling and popping noise. The Earth has three main layers, two parts of the core, the dense, hot inner core, and the molten outer core. Then comes the mantle, and then follows the thin crust, the surface that supports life as we know it. At least, that's what we thought, because now scientists found a new mysterious layer located deep within the solid inner core. Earth's inner core is approximately two-thirds the size of the Moon, and made of nickel and solid iron. It's burning hot. The temperature at the center of our planet is the same as at the surface of the sun. The outer core can reach almost 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's difficult to explore it because we can't go there. And it's like looking through a really dirty window of 3,200 miles of molten metal and rocks. But we can rely on laboratory experiments on heated pressurized rocks signals from seismic waves, and computer models. When an earthquake hits, it sends out seismic shock waves. Those waves travel through layers at a different speed, depending on the direction they go and the material they move through. In the new study, a team of scientists set a data set of 100,000 deep earthquakes. Some of them went over 60 miles below the surface. When an earthquake happens on one side of our planet, scientists track its waves all along to the other side. Waves change when they come to the other side, so scientists try to understand the materials these waves have passed through. They found a new layer in the core of our planet thanks to earthquakes. Normally, shock waves travel along the equator, but down below, they digress and go into different directions, about 60 degrees to the side. When waves pass through the inner core going from north to south, they will travel more quickly than waves going through the core parallel to the equator. It's important to understand the core because it creates our magnetic field, which in turn protects the planet from things like solar winds that are charged particles coming from the sun. In the 1960s, we discovered the Earth pulsates every 26 seconds. It's like clockwork, a giant heartbeat. The ground is slightly shaking, but we mostly don't feel it. Researchers can still track it. Some of them think the continental shelf comes as a huge wave break under the oceans. For example, the highest part of the North American continent falls off into a deep abyssal plain. One theory says waves hit this spot, producing regular pulses. It's like having all kinds of drums. You hit them with your hands and accidentally slam that one spot that produces the right harmonic bang to rattle our entire planet. If this theory is true, we're lucky there are no more spots like this that can shake the Earth. Other scientists believe the pulsation happens because there's a volcano near the critical spot, the island of Sao Tome in the Bight of Bonny. You're walking, running, and jumping, but when you stop, it always feels like you're standing still. In reality, you're moving even when you're perfectly still because our planet is always on the move. Depending on where you're at, you could be spinning through the universe at more than 1,000 miles per hour. 
If you're on the equator, you'll move the fastest. Let's say you have a basketball spinning on your finger. Check the ball's equator. A random point on it has farther to go in just one spin than any point near your finger. That means the point on the equator is moving more quickly. The Earth is a planet that recycles all the time. The ground we're walking on is recycled. Our planet's rock cycle turns rocks of one type into another. That's a cycle that goes on and on. The depths of our planet are filled with magma. As magma is going out onto the surface, it hardens into rock. Tectonic processes like volcanic activity, earthquakes, mountain building, and all of the other processes that shape the surface of our planet bring that rock to the Earth's surface. When the rock is on the surface, erosion shapes it and shaves its bits off. Those small particles then get deposited. All the pressure coming from above compacts the particles into sedimentary rocks, like, for example, sandstone. Sedimentary rocks can also end up deeper and deeper under the Earth's surface. Since there's a lot of heat and pressure, they get cooked into metamorphic rocks. They can go back to the surface once again, or even end up being re-eroded. Sometimes the crust plates are pushing one under another, and this way, rocks can transform into magma once again. We've explored only 5% of the ocean so far. The ocean itself, as well as life below the seafloor, is still a mystery. The sediments that are underlying our oceans are home to different microorganisms that exist even at depths of 1.5 miles beneath the seafloor. There are microbes hidden deep inside volcanic rocks below the seafloor off of the parts of the Pacific, hidden under 870 feet of sediment. The biosphere under the seafloor is growing extremely slowly compared to life on the surface. Cell division happens every 10 to 1,000 years. Something's different about the Earth's axis. Climate changes and melting glaciers, mostly in the regions like the Himalayas and Alaska, made the axis shift. Our planet has two kinds of poles. Are the south and north magnetic poles? They affect they affect things such as drift and navigation. The axis that the Earth is spinning around is another kind of pole. It shifted a little bit over time, but we don't know exactly why. Researchers realize there are moving masses of water, pushing the Earth's axis eastward. Take a basin of water as an example. If you're moving it back and forth, sloshing makes the water move its weight all around. A similar thing is happening on a planetary level. No matter how large an earthquake is, no human could ever feel an earthquake on the opposite side of the Earth, although some people claim they did. In 2013, there was one near the Kuril Islands with a magnitude of 8.5. It went around 400 miles deep. It was so strong, people in Australia reported they could feel the ground shaking. The strongest earthquake happened in Chile, in 1960 with a magnitude of 9.5. The rupture zone stretched from 311 miles to almost 620 miles along the country's coast. Earthquakes with a magnitude of 10 or higher can't happen. The magnitude depends on the length of the fault where it occurs. The longer the fault, the bigger the earthquake. A fault is a break in a part of the planet's crust. It has rocks on both sides, and they move past each other. We haven't found a fault long enough to generate earthquakes with a magnitude of 10 or more. If it happened, it would extend around most of our planet. An earthquake with a magnitude of 12 would require a fault larger than our planet. One side of our planet is getting colder than the other. The Earth has a system that keeps it warm from the inside, a red-hot liquid interior deep below the surface it spins and, at the same time, generates a magnetic field and gravity. That way, the Earth's core holds the atmosphere closer to the planet's surface. The Earth also absorbs heat from the Sun, mostly on the surface. The heat doesn't spread equally on all parts of the Earth. One side of the planet, the Pacific Hemisphere, is losing heat more quickly than another, the African Hemisphere. This happens because land traps more heat than the surface under the ocean. 
the seafloor is way thinner than the landmass. Also, the temperature caused by the heat coming from inside the Earth is getting lower because of huge amounts of cold water above it. Clouds are not just like some fluffy distant pieces of cotton. They weigh more than a million pounds and help regulate our planet's temperature. If you take all the water droplets and clouds and bring them to the surface, you could cover the planet with a liquid layer as thin as a human hair. It doesn't seem like a lot, but this water is crucially important for climate. We'd have warmer temperatures if it weren't for the clouds. In November 1922, a boy walked through the desert mountains of Egypt and discovered some ancient steps carved into the rock. Subsequently, this find became one of the world's largest and most significant archaeological discoveries. This step was part of Tutankhamun's untouched tomb. Archaeologists found about 5,000 ancient objects, including jewelry, fabrics, painted vases, and funeral masks. You've probably seen one of them. It has become one of the most recognizable attributes of ancient Egypt. More than a hundred years have passed since then, and now humanity has finally become close to another large-scale discovery, the tomb of Cleopatra. This queen was the last active ruler of the Ptolemaic Kingdom of Egypt, who sat on the throne from 51 to 30 BCE. There are many ancient records about Cleopatra, her reign, and her unusual personality. But until now, no one has discovered the secrets about her passing away in the burial place. So, one archaeologist, Dr. Kathleen Martinez, has been studying ancient records and temples around Alexandria for decades and concluded that the tomb of the queen should be located under the ancient city of Taposiris Magna, founded in 280 BCE. It was a big city on the northern coast of Egypt, where tens of thousands of people were engaged in trade and industry. And it seems that Dr. Martinez's guesses turned out to be correct. She and a group of archaeologists have discovered a secret underground tunnel near Alexandria, with a length of about 0.8 miles. It was cut into the rock under Taposiris Magna's temple. During further excavations, they found many things that indicate Cleopatra's tomb lies in the tunnel's depths. It's also possible that she is buried there together with the Roman commander, Mark Antony. According to ancient records, Cleopatra and Mark Antony loved each other and together opposed the Roman Senate, which declared Antony a traitor. The fact that natural disasters have occurred on the territory of Taposiris Magna for thousands of years can complicate the excavations. Earthquakes and floods destroyed the city and possibly flooded its underground tunnels. But archaeologists hope the ancient tomb remains untouched and that it hides many treasures and records about the royal life of ancient Egypt during the reign of the last dynasty. There's a chance that excavations will go underwater and in the mud. This will require much time and funding, but archaeologists are sure it's worth it. Anyway, it's too early to say that Cleopatra is really buried there, but scientists have found many things in the tunnel that confirm this, including clay pots, dozens of coins with the image of Cleopatra and Alexander the Great, as well as a bust with the image of the Egyptian queen. Cleopatra is still one of the most popular personalities in Egypt, on an equal footing with Rameses III and Tutankhamun. She inspired many films, paintings, and books, but what made her so popular? She became famous for her inconsistency. She was a beautiful, intelligent ruler who pulled Egypt out of the crisis and made it a prosperous power. Medieval Arabic texts say she knew chemistry, mathematics, and philosophy, and may have written several scientific books. She knew several languages and had excellent diplomatic skills. At the same time, there are many legends that she was a femme fatale who drove many men crazy. However, there's no evidence that her beauty was incomparable. The image of a stunning model was created by Hollywood when it made several films where famous actresses performed the role of Cleopatra. And the Roman Emperor Octavian, the adopted son of Julius Caesar, specially created the image of Cleopatra as an insidious seductress because he was her enemy. Even though she was born in Egypt, Cleopatra wasn't an Egyptian. Her ancestors were Greeks, among whom was one of the generals of Alexander the Great. However, the people of Egypt loved her, 
She learned the language and was very sensitive to the traditions of this country. She knew the history, mentality, and customs of ancient Egypt well. She raised the level of its economy and strengthened its status as a world power. Much of this was made possible thanks to her cunning and impressiveness. She loved theatrical performances and lavish celebrations. She knew how to surprise people and put on a show. But behind the exterior image of a luxury lover was an intelligent and calculating ruler. Ancient Egypt was a rich, luxurious country, and Cleopatra did everything to increase its wealth and strengthen its position in the international arena. For example, she was once in conflict with her brother Ptolemy XIII Thot. The queen knew that she wouldn't be able to resist him, so she decided to attract Julius Caesar to their side. The Roman emperor arrived in Alexandria, where Cleopatra wanted to meet him. But Ptolemy knew about her plans and was about to prevent her from coming to Caesar. Then, instead of a rich and noisy arrival, Cleopatra decided to make her visit inconspicuous. She wrapped herself in a carpet or linen bag the emperor's servants carried into Caesar's private chambers. Cleopatra emerged from the carpet and impressed the Roman emperor with her beauty and determination. As a result, they fell in love with each other and became close allies. After some time, she impressed another influential Roman for diplomatic purposes. She arrived to meet Mark Antony on a golden barge with purple sails and silver oars. Cleopatra was dressed in the image of Aphrodite and sat under a magnificent canopy. Her servants dressed like cupids and were blowing her fan and burning incense. But Cleopatra created such a show for a reason. She knew that Antony revered Greek mythology and considered himself the embodiment of Dionysus. As a result, he was so impressed with this woman that he ended up marrying her. Cleopatra defended her crown, strengthened her alliance with Rome, and bore Antony three children. In Egypt, they threw big parties and enjoyed wealth with power. However, the relationship of a high-ranking official with the Egyptian queen caused a scandal in Rome. Octavian was Antony's primary opponent in the struggle for power, so he exploited the situation to darken the competitor's reputation. He used propaganda to make Cleopatra an insidious seductress in the eyes of Roman citizens. He accused Antony of succumbing to her charms. The Roman Senate supported Octavian and declared Cleopatra an enemy. In 33 BCE, this conflict reached a high point when Antony's navy clashed with Octavian's fleet. The latter won and forced his enemy to flee to Egypt with Cleopatra. According to some records, they took refuge near Alexandria, pursued by the Romans. They hid in one of Cleopatra's palaces and met their end. Some legends say that Cleopatra was an expert in poisons. She provoked a venomous snake, a viper or an Egyptian cobra, to bite her. Also, according to another legend, she pricked herself with a poisonous needle. There's a theory that Cleopatra always carried an ampule with poison inside her hairbrush. And when she was cornered, she soaked the needle with this poison and pricked herself. None of this can be said for sure. Scientists are still trying to find out the truth. Perhaps when they reach Cleopatra's tomb, the world will get more answers about her tragic fate. She is considered the last ruler of Egypt. After her passing, Octavian plundered her palaces and temples and returned to Rome, where he became the main emperor. He successfully ruled the country and expanded its borders. His reign ended when he turned 75. World history would have looked different if Cleopatra and Mark Antony hadn't lost that naval battle. By the way, did you know that more time has passed between Cleopatra's reign and Neil Armstrong's flight to the moon than between the reign of the Egyptian queen and the construction of the Great Pyramid of Giza? Armstrong took a step on the Earth's satellite in 1969, 2038 years after the birth of Cleopatra. And the construction of the pyramid took place in 2560 BCE. Imagine how long the history